Hey guys. Hey y'all. What's going on? How are you? Good. How are you? We are live. Let me open up the chat. I see people coming in. Happy Saturday. Yes, beautiful day. Carson, I see Dwayne Murray, I see Keto. Cool, let's check in and check our audio and then I will be bringing you guys back on, okay? Give me one second, I see everybody's connecting. Let's see, let me open up my chat. Hey guys, if you can hear us okay, if you guys can hear us okay, please comment one, comment one if you can hear us okay. There we go, we got Trevorrow, everybody is here. All right, we are here, I see you guys. All right, right. hey, hey, hey. Hey. Cool, 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 all right. So we are gonna jump right in, I'm gonna get into some housekeeping panelists. You guys feel free to turn your, uh, your cameras on. I'm gonna mute you guys out until it's your time to come on. And I am excited, yeah, I am excited. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, guys. So I'm gonna mute y'all out for one second, and then I'll bring you on when it's your uh, time to present. And this is going to be amazing. Okay. Cool. All right. So let's see. And I see some other people connecting. Okay, cool. All right. Hey, guys. So my name is Deanna Britt. I am the owner of Law Clerk On Demand, and I want to welcome you to Creative Deals 101. This is a subgroup, which we call it super groups here at South Atlanta Rhea. I'm super, super excited. You guys know me for providing lists and our company pulls lists from the courthouse every 30 days. And just for like legal questions related to probate, evictions, divorce, and like how do real estate investors find deals from the courthouse. But I have, that's not my only hat. I absolutely love, and it's actually my favorite thing, probably even more than providing lists, believe, believe it or not, which is the teaching aspect, right? And so I am so honored to be able to be um, the facilitator for this group, okay? So um, what we're gonna do here is today, we're going to get into uh, creative financing strategy. Um, I have the pleasure of finding the speakers for you guys. This is something that we do every single month, okay? And so um, what we're gonna do is we have four speakers, four speakers, okay, that are going to cover their personal experience in um, creative financing, their experiences with subject two. I know for a fact they are really, really doing deals, okay? Um, every time I talk to them, these folks are really like posting deals posting like you know they always have something going on um and i've had the pleasure of knowing these guys for years so i am just so excited about what they have to share with you but before we get started i do want to tell you guys a little bit about south atlanta Rhea. i know many of you um have were introduced to this meeting from like social media um matter of fact tell me in the comments how did you hear about this meeting and i'm going to tell you why i always ask this question can you tell me in the comments how you found out about this meeting happening right now how'd you find out where did you see it social media Somebody said you. Okay, well, where where did I tell you? <laughs> Other investors, email, okay. From Law Clerks Live, okay, that was probably me. Another meeting. Where else, where else? We got a good crew, a good group in here too. Okay. The reason why I'm asking is because tracking is really, really important in marketing. You gotta know what is working for you. So anytime I do a webinar, if I remember, cause sometimes I come in on 10 and I forget, but you really should be tracking your marketing, right? And so for us, you know, at Law Clerk On Demand, we really ramped up our social media marketing. So I need to know if it's working, right? <laughs> so the fact that you guys are here, that shows me that posting on social media works, right? Or going live works. Like, so a lot of people are saying, I just went live five minutes ago to remind people that we have this meeting because sometimes the algorithm messes that up, right? So 
while we talk about creative financing today, we're also going to cover a little bit of marketing. Please ask these superstar investors um, how they approach marketing, how they track their marketing, you know, because what I have found is that a lot of times people want the results, but they forget to ask the how. I actually stole that from Eric Thomas, right? I was listening to him and he was like, everybody wants to be successful, but nobody asks me the steps. They don't ask me what I do every day. How do I get up when my phone isn't ringing, when I'm not getting the results that I want, right? So ask them how. These folks have set aside their Saturday to, um, <laughs> Marquis said, whenever I see a law clerk live, I try to make it my business to tap in. I'm so honored you say that because look, I got people on Instagram that I tap in every time they go live. I, I think lives are amazing because while Zoom is efficient, you know, Zoom is great. Instagram, we're already on the gram, right? And so there's so many people during this, um, during this season, during the pandemic, while we're quarantined, that have done nothing but give value. And so this is an example of that. But going back to South Atlanta Rhea, um, this is one of the benefits of being a member. So while this meeting has been free, normally there's like a charge to attend this meeting. It's like $10, right? But I waive that due to everything that's going on. But if you join South Atlanta Rhea, you can actually go to meetings like this totally for free. And there's 18, I think we're up to 19 different meetings on different topics. So the way that they work is I'm over creative financing, but there's a mobile homes group, there's rental groups, there's getting started for beginners, there's north side, south side, west side, east side, like there's a group for like everything you can think of in real estate. There's a money management group, you know, how do I get myself in position to lend? So if you join South Atlanta Rhea and I'll join, you know, I'll be dropping the links and stuff in the comments. Um, you have the benefit of going to all those meetings and then you can also come to our main meeting where you can meet ben vendors like myself. You can meet lenders, attorneys, uh, get your list, find, figure out who's a good contractor, et cetera. You can come to the meeting and meet people. So people ask me, well, Deanna, how do I find an attorney that's investor friendly? How do I find a lender? who, um, how do I find transactional funding, whatever it is that you're looking for, that's usually in your real estate investor association. And while every RIA is different, I definitely can attest that South Carolina RIA, it works really, really hard to give that to you. So our founder, Stacy, she's a former coach. This is what she does, she's actually coaching again. Um, but you have benefits like on Mondays, I know I don't miss Ask Me Anything once a month with Stacy because I can sit there and ask her real estate questions, right? So after this meeting, you can literally go to Ask Me Anything next month and say, hey, Stacy, I went to Creative Deals, but I still have questions. And you can ask her her opinion, right? So these are the benefits of connecting with your real estate investor community, joining a real estate investor association, this is your club, your community to talk out the obstacles that you're facing. Does that make sense? Do we have any South Atlanta RIA members in here? Please check in. If you are a South Atlanta RIA member, um, give me a seven. <laughs> give me a seven in the chat if you're a, there we go. South Atlanta RIA members are in the house. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Cool. All right. It is um, just about time for our first speaker. Let me just pull this up. Y'all know I got a little schedule over here because I'm overly organized. Um, <laughs> So, and then also I want you guys to tell me where you're from as well, because I know not everyone is in Atlanta. So could you please tell me where you're checking in from as I pull up the schedule for you guys? ATL, I see McDonough specifically in New York is in the house. Cool. Locust Grove, I like it. South Atlanta, okay, if you South Atlanta, then that means I'm gonna be seeing you at the main meeting, okay? Yeah, connect with people in the comments. Um, remember that if you are saying something, you have to do all panelists and attendees if your question is um, for, like if you're doing like a community question, make sure you say all panelists and attendees um, on the chat. Also, if you have questions, drop your questions. If you hover over the bottom bar, there's a Q&A button, okay? 
once you hover over that, you can type your question to the panelists. The way that today is gonna work, we're gonna have four panelists speak. They're gonna drop heat. It's gonna be amazing. At the end, I have asked them to stay on and do like a full panel of Q&A, okay? So if time doesn't permit for us to get to your question, I will take note of it and I will make sure that we get to your question at the end or you can just ask it at the end. So don't write your question in the chat because the chat goes fast. Put it in the Q&A box. Y'all with me? All right. I think that's everything. I think it's time for our first speaker. We'll just go ahead and jump in now. Um, I am so excited, okay? Um, our first speaker actually runs Aria himself. Um, we have Carson Olinger, who is someone who is seasoned, seasoned um, in real estate investing and creative financing and even runs um, ARIA as well. So I've asked him to come on. I actually reached out to him a couple of months ago and then I told him we were going virtual. He still hung in there with me. <laughs> so this is great. Um, so if you guys can drop some ones in the chat since we're virtual and show him some love. I can't bring them on until you show them some love. So drop some ones in the chat as we switch over. Um, and I'm going to give Carson the floor and then we'll roll into our next speaker. There we go. We need some ones. Make him feel welcome, y'all. Okay. Hi, Carson. How are you? I'm doing great, Deanna. How are you today? Good, good. Welcome, welcome. Um, I am going to... There you go. All right, can everybody see him clearly and hear him? All right, you got lots of ones. Okay, Carson, well, I'm gonna give you the floor. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity, Deanna. Thank you very much for having me. It's great You're to be welcome. part of the awesome panel with uh, Trevorrow and Keto and Dwayne. I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say as well. <clears throat> and also curious where you guys are from. So I'll start off with that, Deanna. I am here locally in the Atlanta metro area on the north side of town. Um, I've met uh, you personally several times, as well as uh, Stacy Rossetti. As you mentioned, I am president of North Lake Rhea, which meets in Gainesville, Georgia. And we focus more on education and networking. So we're always bringing in different people to highlight different real estate topics. For instance, creative financing, how to find deals, wholesaling, what have you. So um, that's what we do. We meet the last Wednesday of every month. But you know, with COVID going on, uh, we've had some struggles with that. So we haven't had an opportunity to meet, but we're hoping in June that uh, things will pick back up. And as you mentioned, I am uh, here locally in Atlanta. I'm in Swanee, which is kind of in the Gwinnett County, Hall County kind of corridors where I focus. I'm expanding my business into Charlotte and into Tampa. So I'm looking and doing some uh, virtual wholesaling as well as trying to put some boots on the ground in those respective areas so that we can start flipping homes as well. A little bit about me, uh, as I said, I'm from North Atlanta here. I've been doing this not really that long, only about three years. So I'm still learning quite a bit, but I've taken to it like fish to water. And honestly, I just, I love what I do. I have, um, this isn't work for me. I, I totally love what I'm doing. I love helping other people, either through these types of platforms, through my RIA, or actually even the customers and the clients I work with. Um, through our creative acquisitions, which I'm going to get into here in a little while, we're able to create solutions for people. So I do little things differently than most. Um, I don't find my opportunities through driving for dollars. I don't do buying lists. I don't do a lot of those traditional things with frequency. I have done them. I just find that there's other ways that work for me so I can spend my time closing deals as opposed to finding deals. So Quite honestly, I use a PPC and SEO lead generation system that's managed for me externally. Um, when, I brought, when I came on board with um, this whole business, I recognized pretty quickly that you're either gonna spend time looking for deals or you're gonna spend money looking for deals. And on the front end, like all of us, we probably had more time than money and uh, we needed to make more money. And then when we found out we had more money, we didn't have as much time. So I wanted to put systems in place that, that, that work forward. And what I found was I, I was pretty good at subject to acquisition. I understood it on uh, creative acquisitions through owner financing, through uh, lease options and all kinds of other different uh, avenues. I'm gonna focus a lot on subject to because it seems like of all of the 
the uh, methodologies that we've implemented um, year to date, I mean, since we've been, we started, subject two seems to have the most questions, I guess, because it's a little bit outside of the, the box, if you will. The company I own is Capital City Equity Group, and we focus basically on people's equity and how to manage that for them. I also own a consulting group, which is Southeastern Associates, uh, and I use that for my wholesaling. So when you're structuring your business, if you're new out there, uh, it's, a, it's good to have an LLC to hold property to have another title. And it's also good to have an S-Corp. So my S-Corp is my uh, Southeastern Associates. So I work for Southeastern Associates, but Capital City Equity Group is more of the, <clears throat> the brand that I promote. So what I'm gonna do is, is talk about three things. And like I said, I'll spend more time on the subject to acquisition. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about owner financing, either through creative acquisition or disposition. And then additionally, I'll talk about lease options, which are great for dispositions. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do here with our company is create long-term cash flow. Um, this business can be a one-trick pony if you're not careful. So when I started out wholesaling, that's all I did was wholesale. It was kind of a gateway drug, right? So it got me acclimated into the business. I surrounded myself with people uh, like Trevorrow and Dwayne and Keto, the people that know more than I do in certain areas. And I feed off of them and hopefully I can give my strengths and help their weaknesses because uh, we all have strengths and weaknesses. And so I find by the people that are smarter than me, they help iron out my weaknesses and I become stronger and hopefully we can reciprocate with our respective businesses and grow, grow outside of that. So with all that being said, subject two was taught to me by a, a colleague of mine and I grasped it, I understood it. And I'm gonna try and share my screen here because I've got a, a presentation I'm gonna try and move through. So if you don't see it, just let me know. Um, let me find it here. So this is a PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna expand this out a little bit more. I can get in here. So we're gonna talk about creative deal structure, how to find structure and close real estate deals via subject to owner finance and lease options. Okay, so I gotta move my screen over here to the right. There we go. So topics we'll be going over are what is subject to? Is it legal? And who would even do it? We're going to talk about what are the pitfalls, concerns, and objections, and how to overcome them with the seller. One of the biggest things we run into is, hey, we can explain it, but people just don't understand it in layman terms. I'm going to help you do that. What info and, and data do I actually need to structure the deal? Okay, if I'm going to do subject to, there's certain financial criteria you're going to need to understand how to set up the contracts. I actually have a contract I'll show you. And what are the financial benefits? And then the back end exit strategies associated with it. We'll talk about land trusts and why they're important regarding subject to. It's almost imperative, I would say. Um, furthermore, we'll get into lease options, as I mentioned, and owner financing, okay? So a little bit about me. I think I went over some of this, so I won't spend too much time here. I am managing partner of Capital City Equity Group. I'm president. Southeastern Associates, which is more of my wholesaling and consulting company, and I'm president of North Lake RIA in Gainesville, Georgia. I've transacted about 50 deals it's in my almost, not quite three years, it'll be end of July, it'll be three years. I've had 12 flips, I've got four, four portfolio properties, and within those 50, I've done 18 subject to transactions. I have not paid any formal training, I've never had a mentor that I paid, I didn't get in involved with fortune builders or anything like that. I'm pretty much self-taught, but I will highlight that with an asterisk. I've had a lot of help from a lot of experienced real estate investors that are willing to help and guide me, which I can do for you too. And I'm sure our other panelists can as well. Um, I have been featured on panels like this on Flip Junkie back in 18. I was a panelist here locally on Shark Tank, not the national Shark Tank, but we, the Atlanta area has one that's called Shark Tank. I've been a presenter for Stacey Rossetti, uh, The Good, the Bad, the Ugly, and then various other speaking engagements around Atlanta. So getting right into this, um, is subject to legal and why would anyone even do this? I know we have a limited amount of time, so I'm gonna kind of move forward with this to allow the other panelists an equal amount of time and then for all of us to answer questions at the end. But to answer this question, 
Subject to is 100% and completely legal. And I'll explain why, but there's no Ill illegalities about that. Banks don't typically like it, but it is legal. Um, purchasing a home subject to, what does that really mean? It means buying the, the property while keeping the existing mortgage in place, subject to the existing mortgage. So we own, as the owners, the deed and title at closing, and the original owner who we bought it from maintains the mortgage in their name. Going forward, we take over the financial obligation of that. So you have title and deed, the mortgage stays in place, and then we pay that going forward. And I'm going to talk about the land trust and how that plays into this, because a lot of people will think that it's predatory, that, hey, you're taking advantage of these people that might be in a financially disadvantaged situation. The land trust legally protects them and you as the investor. And I'll talk about that here shortly. Okay. So banks don't like this. Okay. Why? Because they lent the money, they did the actual loan with the person that bought the house originally, not with you. So you're not on their documents. You're not on their paperwork. They don't really know who you are. So we're basically doing what they call the old assumption or you're assuming a mortgage, but not technically because most mortgages today are not assumable. I'll repeat that. Most are not assumable. So people think logically, if it's not assumable, then I can't do subject to. That's not the case. Okay. Like I said, banks don't like it, but there's no laws in place that prevent it. So you're not working in a gray area. This is black and white. I don't operate in a gray area. It's completely ethical, completely legal. Um, we approach the process from a vantage point of providing the seller, the person who owns the house, with an actual solution that's mutually beneficial for them and for us. Okay? Most sellers that utilize subject to have some type of financial or physical distress in the property where it's just they're way upside down in some way, shape, or form. So there's motivation, and I'm going to talk a lot about motivation. Motivation is critical, I think, in any type of a deal, but specifically with subject two. Okay, the seller is either behind on their mortgage and they're facing foreclosure. Okay, some sellers that are downsizing and dislike homeownership, they might even be moving into a rental situation. So they're not going to have to worry about that mortgage, which is in their name. What I mean by that is these people may want to move, right? Well, they're going to have to. So if they move to another home, they're going to have a hard time getting a mortgage. Well, first of all, it's probably not in their cards a lot of times because their, their credit's been trashed because they haven't been paying their mortgage They're four or five months behind. So it's usually not an issue, but occasionally you'll get someone that will have the ability to go and buy another home. We've got ways of giving them supporting documentation, showing that house that they just sold to me, which still has their name on the mortgage as being an asset and looks kind of like a rental property. So we'll provide them with income statements and things like that so that they can qualify for that second mortgage. It's kind of rare that that happens, but it's plausible and we have ways to deal with that to overcome one of those objections, okay? So um, as we move forward here, what are the pitfalls, the concerns, and the objections? All right, the big one, the big elephant in the room, well, what if the bank calls the note due? What if I close on this house, Carson? Now I own it. I got to pay the mortgage to Bank of America. I'm two months into this. I got $15,000 in a rehab and the bank finds out and they call the note due. That's a risk. That is a risk. I can't say that it won't happen. However, how often does it happen? You hear about the ones that happen because they're quite an anomaly. It don't happen that often. Usually it's predicated by the seller feeling like they got taken advantage of in some way, shape or form, calling the bank and saying, hey, this all happened. I feel like I've been thrown under the bus. Now the bank starts putting their focus on your deal. If, if the seller's happy and they've got no reason to complain backward to the bank, usually you don't have any problems. And I say usually, that's like 99% of the time, okay? It does happen. You hear about them from time to time. It has never happened to me. I know some people that have done multiple transactions, a lot more than I have. And I think of all the people that I've met, only it's happened to them once, and that was years ago. And there were some odd circumstances with that. But I will qualify that. It, it can happen, but we're in a risky business to begin with, all right? There is some risk. But worst case scenario, how do you deal with that? Well, you then need to refinance the property and get out of it. 
And we're going to talk about is the deal good subject to and not good in cash. There's a balance there. So usually you use the same qualifying metrics to buy the house subject to as you would if you paid cash. You're not going to buy a house subject to with only $5,000 worth of equity in it. You have to put $10,000 in it. You'll still be upside down. You still use the same math as you would be buying cash as you would subject to. So the potential of refinancing if this happens is quite plausible and you could probably do it because there's enough equity in the deal because you bought it right. So what if the buyer does not pay the mortgage each month, meaning me, I'm the buyer. What happens? Well, the land trust takes care of that, okay? And this is an objection you're gonna have with the seller. The seller's gonna say, well, hey, wait a minute. I'm giving you this mortgage, it's in my name. What if you don't pay? Well, the, I use a basic statement. So if I walk outside the closing room, I get in my car and I get hit by a truck, and I'm out of the equation. What happens? Well, the land trust protects all of that. I'll get into the specifics of that here momentarily. But the land trust, without going through a foreclosure, without going through an eviction or anything else, is a simple moving the trustee from me to the original seller. Now they get their house back. And they're going to say, well, I don't want my house back. I'm already upside down. Well, I've already bought it. Now you're current because we caught the mortgage up current. And I'll talk about that too. You don't have the debt that you're there. Your mortgage is current. So now you got three or four more months, even if you can't afford to make the mortgage payment, to sell the house again. Plus, you just got the money I paid you on the, on the closing costs. And I, you're ahead of the game. So they get their asset back, okay? So they're protected. But what if the seller does not take the deal you're offering? Well, maybe you can offer them a little bit more money, okay? Maybe you can give them a little bit more walking away cash. There's all kinds of ways around that. You will show them how you will protect both your interests and their interests in a legally structured land trust with the attorney. Okay, we'll go over more of that later. You'll show them that they will make a profit when with you and get current on their mortgage and you will help improve their credit rating long term. What I mean by that is if someone's got a thousand dollar a month mortgage and they're behind five months, they're in the rears five grand. Okay. There are also probably attorney fees, legal fees, and associates, let's call it $7,000. In order to get current, me, the buyer, I've got to bring $7,000 to the table to catch that mortgage current. On top of that, whatever money I'm offering them to walk away from the house, I got to bring that at the closing table, plus closing costs, okay? Hopefully that number is a lot smaller than what a 20% down payment would be. Usually it is, okay? Because if you think about a subject to deal and someone's getting foreclosed on, potentially, they're going to lose everything. They're going to get no money. They're going to be out on the street. They're going to have no asset. I mean, the house is gone. The bank's going to take it. And the bank's going to chase them for that difference. So what are we doing? We're catching their mortgage up current. They don't have the debt now. We're taking over the mortgage payment. We're paying them current, improving their credit rating, and at the same time, giving them cash to walk away, which they never would have seen. So we provided a solution, okay? And they can never, ever, ever stay in the house. So do not ever rent the house back to somebody who you just purchased it subject to. A couple of reasons. One, why would you? They can't make the mortgage payment. How are they going to pay you rent? Doesn't make any sense. Secondly, and I think most importantly, is if you ever got in front of a judge after something happened because there was, I don't know what could go wrong. I've, I've heard of these things happening but you'll be looked at as a predator because now you've taken the person's house and you're renting it to them. So they always need to move out. Okay. <clears throat> so what information, what data, what actual numbers do you need to have from the seller in order to make all this work? Well, one, you need to know what the balance of the mortgage is to date. Okay. And that number is not going to be exact. So let's say they owe $150,000 on the mortgage and they're $5,000 in the rears, okay? Keep in mind that $5,000 is representative principal and interest. So if you pay $5,000 to the bank at closing, it doesn't mean you got a $145,000 note. You gotta see the principal and interest statements to understand how much of that 5,000 is gonna go to principal, and how much is gonna go to interest, and how much goes to the, the escrows that are gonna be caught up. What is the mortgage terms? You're inheriting this mortgage, you're taking it over. So you need to understand what this is. Is it a balloon mortgage? Do I have to pay this thing off in five years? Is it a variable rate? What's the interest rate? What's the maturity date? 
How deep are they into that amortization schedule? And what's the monthly breakdown of the payment? The principal, the interest, the taxes, and the insurance, PITL. You need to know what those are so you can ask them for a current mortgage statement and it'll probably have all that information on there, okay? Additional liens for second mortgages, you need to know about those. A lot of times those will come up in second or in um, title searches, but if you're having that conversation, you might want to get that ahead of time. If they're late on their, their mortgage, they might be late on their taxes, they might be late on their water bill, they might be, they might have a medical debt tied to the house. You want to know what those are. We're not too concerned about the seconds if they're not associated with banks, for instance, medical loans, but a lot of times they have to be cleared. And here's something else to be aware of. A lot of people that get into these situations may have previously gone through a refinance or a restructuring of their loan, okay? Which means they went to the bank and said, hey, I'm four months behind. Can we restructure this and put all that money on the back end of the loan? What happens there in a lot of cases is the bank sends them a stack of paperwork that they're signing. And what they don't realize is they've just signed a second note to HUD. They don't have to pay that back, it kind of sits there. And we found on a couple of these deals where the people have restructured their loans and there's thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 sitting back there. They don't pay it on daily or on monthly maintenance, I should say. But when the house goes to sell, you got to clear the mortgage. Plus, when you throw all that money in the back, it has to be taken care of. So it's in essence, the number one and the number two. So you need to be aware of those. If they've ever restructured their loan, always look for that HUD document that will probably be in their paperwork, but will also come up in a title search, okay? Um, how many months behind are they? Are they two months, three months, four months? And that's important to know because banks, today it's a little different with the COVID issue going on, but traditionally they get four or five months behind, then they start getting the letters, okay? We are seeing the customers coming to us about two to three months before they go to the steps, meaning the courthouse steps, okay? As opposed to buying a list where you got two or three weeks to react, we got two or three months. So people are a little bit more open to looking for solutions rather than, hey, three weeks from now, this is done, there's no way. They don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So it gives you more time because it takes about a couple of weeks at the best to get this done. So how many months behind are they? You wanna know that because that's also gonna tell you how much money they owe to some degree. Um, have the seller, and this is important to do, have the seller get in touch with their bank and just say simply this, I might be coming into some extra money and I can probably catch my mortgage up current. Can I please get a reinstatement letter? It's called a reinstatement letter. They need to get that from their bank. Don't tell them someone's going to buy the house. Don't tell them anything other than I may be getting some extra money. I want to know how much my reinstatement letter is. What is that? That is how much money do I need to pay tomorrow to catch my, my bank note up current? Okay, that's going to be the money I got to bring to the closing table. The, the bank will pr provide that information. Let's say today's May 16th. They'll say it's worth, you need $7,520, and that number is good till May 30th. After May 30th, it's going to accrue at $35 a, a day based on interest. So now you'll know what your number is, okay, that, what you've got to bring to the table and how much time you've got for that number to be good. Reinstatement letter is very, very important, okay? Then gain a copy of their most recent mortgage statement. I alluded to that earlier. That way you have who the bank is, the loan number, and all that concerning their stats, okay? Now, subject to structure of the contract, okay? I'm gonna show you a contract in just a minute and how we work that. Make sure the contract, your actual contract with the seller, shows the loan number that we're talking about, the interest rate, and the PITI payment, as well as the payoff. Always reflect the subject to amount as approximate. Don't ever say exact because if you close one day before the next, those numbers can go off by 30, 60, hundred dollars. Okay. Plus there might be some fees that come in there, but if you put approximate, it's going to give you some leeway so that you don't have to rewrite your contract. Reflect the acquisition price, your actual buy price as the amount of the loan plus what money is owed to the bank in the rears plus profit to the seller. So if there's $150,000 owed to the bank and $5,000 owed in the rears, plus they want 5,000, you're gonna make sure all of those things are reflected, okay? The balance due at closing, this is important. The balance due at closing should reflect only 
the seller's profit and only their arrearage. So if we're paying them 5,000 and we're bringing 5,000 to the table to catch a current, they're only getting $10,000 at the table. We're not paying the loan off from them, okay? That loan stays in place. And this is important to make sure your attorney knows this because the attorney does not, I repeat, does not need to get a payoff letter from the bank. They don't even need to contact the bank, okay? We're just taking this thing over. We're doing all this without the bank even knowing it, okay? So you do not need a payoff letter from the bank. But this is important. Make sure your attorney gets the seller to sign a document allowing you at a later date to call the bank on their behalf. Basically a power of attorney regarding the house so that when you go to sell it, you can go get that without having to contact them, the original seller, okay? Attorneys do this all the time, it's pretty simple, okay? So here's the contract. I'm gonna point out, if you can see my pointer here, um, total purchase price to be paid by the buyer, me, okay? I never use any earnest money. When people say, how do you do that? I've bought and sold 50 homes and I've never put in a single dollar of earnest money. So it's usually reflective of zero. The people just don't ask. They typically don't ask, whether it's subject to or otherwise. Okay, on this respective um, deal, the balance due at closing, you see where I put approximate in here. I've got an option to put exact or approximate. And by the way, if anybody wants my contract, I'd be more than happy to provide it. It's simply laid out in layman terminology. It's a three page, it's assignable, and it allows for a standard straight up deal or a um, subject to acquisition. You just put NA, you know, not applicable or needed. So I put zero for earnest money. So this is what's due at closing. Now in this deal, I needed to pay $6,000, I think it was $67.57 to the bank and $4,000 to the seller. So I had to bring that much money to the closing table, not including closing costs, okay? Now, if you go, whoops, sorry, my bad, let me go back. So if I go back here, you'll see that I referenced the subject to the existing loan. The loan balance on their statement was 147.734, okay? I referenced the loan number, the interest rate, it's fixed, principal, I put all that in there, okay? Then there's no, there's no second loan, but the total purchase price was this number, the 147, plus the 4,000 going to the seller. So in essence, I'm buying this house for 151,734. So if I were buying cash and not using subject to, I'd be paying 151,734 for the house. So the bank note would get paid off at 147, and because that's what was owed, and he'd get 4,000, we'd be done. Okay, but I'm not doing that here. I'm giving him four, catching the bank up six, and how do I know that 6,757 number? I got the reinstatement letter. So, I'm gonna pull up another sheet here, bear with me. And this is gonna walk you through the financial mechanics of purchasing a house using hard money. These are the numbers on the deal we just talked about versus subject to. I'm putting in here, I'm kind of keep an eye on my time. Uh, we've got a four month carry, okay? That gives you time for rehab and what have you. The ARV, when we bought it, we assumed it was about 212,000. The principal loan balance, as you saw in the contract, was 147. That's reflective on both sides. The acquisition price is the same whether I buy it cash with hard money or through subject to. The mortgage arrearage would be caught up if we paid that off, but here you can see that it's the same, 67, 47, 58. So the seller profit at closing is gonna be 4,000. That stays the same. My closing costs are a little bit easier and cheaper with um, subject to, why? Because we're not pulling title. We don't have to go through that whole process. It's a lot easier to deal with. I'm not doing appraisals. I'm not doing all that stuff, okay? Because it's already in place. My rehab costs are about the same. It was an eight to $10,000 rehab. It's like we wound up being $9,500 or something, okay? Um, what points to the lender do I need? Well, in this case, I only needed, remember, 6,000 to, um, to the bank and 4,000 to the uh, buyer or seller, I should say, and then another 10,000 for my, my rehab. So really, I only needed to borrow about $25,000, okay? 
and I was going to be done. As opposed to if I went to a hard money lender who's going to loan me money at 10%, keep in mind, I need to put 20% down. So 151, take away 20%, leaves you a balance you're borrowing from hard money at 121. They're going to charge you three points. I got 36, 41, I got to come up with on top of that. Well, so now I've got to come up with a gap of about $30,000 my 151 to 121, plus I got to come up with the 3641 in points, 700 on the appraisal and all the other junk I got to deal with. And then I got to make sure I've got enough interest to carry this thing to pay these guys off. Okay. Carson, so, yeah. Carson, I am so sorry to interrupt you. Are you showing us a um, Excel spreadsheet right now? Yes, if so, we're, we're not seeing it on our end. So they're going a little crazy in the comments. Oh. Can you click one? One more time, maybe it'll pop up. And if you are trying to share screen, remember that um, when you hit the share screen button, you have to make sure you touch that new square. Okay, hang on, let me do that again, I apologize. No worries. Okay. We started a little bit early, so you have a little time, so take your time. Okay, do you see that now? Yes, we do. Okay, I'll it. start this one over again. So okay. this is the same deal we were talking about. So I'm basing this off a of four month carry cost, okay? Over here is a hard money purchase. Over here is a subject two. Same deal, same animal, okay? We're basing this off a $212,000 acquisition. And this is a, a deal we closed this past, this past year. Um, it was a light rehab, so there wasn't much really time. I figured I could do it in about a month and we did it. But I wanted to be careful, so I wanted to make sure I had enough money for four months to carry. The loan balance, as we showed on the last screen, was 147. You see that's reflective on both sides. Nothing's different. The acquisition price, the same. Okay. This is the hard money acquisition, mind you, and this is subject to. So the mortgage was in the rears at 6747. The seller profit was 4,000. Now our closing costs here. It's a little bit higher on hard money because you're actually buying the house, going through deed, title, all the other stuff. I find that um, closing costs with subject to acquisitions are a lot cheaper because one, you don't need to do a title search. And one, we're not dealing with the banks and all the other junk fees that go with it. You're not dealing with the taxes and catching all that up because you're just taking over where they were. You're inheriting their escrows, everything, okay? Rehab costs, we estimated at the time of acquisition, were about 10,000. In actuality, we wound up at 94.50, so we were pretty good. Um, so now, on a hard money, this is where it gets different, okay? We needed, if you do a hard money, I can get better rates than this, but some people just starting out can't. So I use the worst case scenario, especially now with COVID, they're even more conservative. Hard money lenders need about 20% down, okay? They also want you to pay points, and they also have a higher interest rate, but they also want you to have your first release of your rehab in the bank so that you can cover that. They'll reimburse you for that, but they wanna know that you've got it. So you gotta have a lot more money coming out of pocket on the front end. So if your balance of 20% at 80, is 121, that's reflective of the 151 minus 20%. You're borrowing 121 and change. You're paying them three points on that 121, okay? So you gotta come up with that $3,600. You gotta come up with a $30,000 differential between the 151 and the 120. Plus you're gonna be carrying the $1,000 a month mortgage on this 120 at 10%. So it's 1,011 per month, four months on our carry cost is $4,046. If we go over that, we need to have more, but I wanna make sure I've got all that to pay them. It's not coming out of my pocket. I never use my own money. I always use OPM, other people's money, okay? But now I gotta go borrow all that money from someone. So in essence, I need to borrow the 10,000, I need to borrow the 2,500, I need to borrow the 4,000, I need to borrow the 6,757 to catch it up, and I gotta borrow the 20% difference here. $700 in funds, All you add all that up, it's about $50,488 I'm borrowing from somebody, right? Now I gotta pay them interest on that, okay? So if I'm doing that at 10%, then I'm 477 a month on carry, I'm borrowing what I'm gonna pay them back on interest. So I'm borrowing all this, okay? So all that's loaded into this number. Over here, I'm only borrowing $25,000 at 10%, okay? And that's gonna give me the amount of money to pay the arrearage, the seller profit, closing costs and have the rehab in cash ready to go right when we close, okay? Plus a little extra to carry the mortgage payment that's already out there 
which in this case was about a thousand bucks, which is almost the same as what we're paying over here in hard money anyway. Okay, so my carry on the loan is 833 for them, but in this case, since it's such a short deal, I threw it on the back end. So I'm not gonna pay you a monthly carry, I'm gonna put it on the back end, and I'll guarantee you four months. If I sell it in three days, you'll get four months of interest, because 25 grand, people really aren't too keen on wanting to lend 25 grand for one month and make 800 bucks. But if you give them $4,000 or close to it, they're gonna be pretty happy, okay? Um, so that's what I did. So what I needed to come to closing table with the subject two was only $12,800. That's, that's reflective in the 6750, 6747, the 4,000, the $2,048 in closing costs, and then um, that was done. I had everything I needed, okay? Closed the house out, now I own it. I borrowed the 25, the balance of that, I got $10,000 to do the rehab with, okay? Over here, I had to come to the table with $50,488 to pay the hard money, the 20%, there are three points, closing costs, because I'm buying the house here, doing title search, all the other jazz, right? So now, you add everything up IO, I'm in, the, I'm in this thing for 149.54. Over here, once I pay that 67.47 down from this 147.734 that was on the balance, I only owe 141 when I go to sell the house down the road, because I'm current, and that's what's left. So now if you look at the profit model on this, we actually sold it, we were gonna sell it at 212, we sold it actually at 207. So based on 207, we made $40,167 on that deal. We would have made money doing it hard money, but we had jumped through a lot of hoops, had to borrow a lot more money, then a lot more leverage, and had to go through leases and everything else, and we would have only made $26,000, okay? So what does that really translate to? I made 155% on my cash on cash return, meaning $40,000 over my $25,000 that I borrowed. Okay, $26,000 on the $180,000 I borrowed. That's the difference. That's the power of subject two. Okay, my risk was substantially less. Less. I was in and out of the deal very, very quickly. And I'm willing to share this later after we get done with this. I'm going to look at one more screen here. So I'm going to stop sharing for one second and come back to the presentation. And let's see, where is it? Here it is. And Carson, are you ready to, um, I think you have like one or two questions and then we'll be getting ready for the next uh, speaker. So just giving you a heads up um, sure. when you're ready for questions. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll leave it there with the subject too. I won't get too much more into the, uh, owner financing and what have you, but make sure you use an attorney that knows how to structure subject to deals and always put the deal into a land trust. They're very important. It kind of gives some anonymity to you and to them. It looks as if maybe they sold the house and a, and a, uh, a management company's running it. So it kind of gives an umbrella, if you will. There's advantages to having it. And make sure your attorney does not need to get a payoff letter. You get a signed letter, I alluded to this earlier, from the seller at closing, allowing you to request the payoff after you are done with it and want to sell it, okay? And you keep the insurance intact. You just put your name on them with an additional insured. They'll help you with that. And you actually need to know where to send the monthly payment. You got to know where that's going to go. You could do that, you know, through your own bank to bank. You don't have to worry about sending in a check. And let them know that they still get the right off the interest on their taxes because you don't own the mortgage, it's theirs, all right? Um, and when the escrows are all done, you end up getting an escrow check back, okay? Because you structured all that on the front end, all right? So the rest of it's about owner financing. I'll stop sharing at this point here. Um, Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to jump back in. And I think um, what we can do is during the panel, uh, we can get more into that as well. Um, but I wanted to get a couple questions in, which some of them are very similar. Um, and then we will jump in. But thank you for that. You guys, can we give Carson some ones in the chat? Because he killed that presentation. Ones in the chat. 
One's in the chat. There we go. There we go. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for that. That was really, really good. Um, the main question that we're getting, like people are like screaming in the Q&A box. So they want to know what can they have access to your to your contract? And I think you you mentioned that you would make that available. Yes, absolutely. I'll be more than happy if you want to email me directly at Carson at capcityeg.com. That's Carson at capcityeg.com. Uh, just say, you know, just reference our, our webinar here and contract, and I'll be more than happy to send you the contract that I use. Okay, you said Carson at C A P C I T Y E as an echo, G as in George.com. That is correct. Got it. Okay, guys, I just put that in the chat. Um, last two questions. Somebody asked for a copy of the slides. Yes. Do you do I copies do of too. your slide? Okay. Yep. Okay. So just email him, guys, and he will give you all the sauce. Okay. So that's done. And some, okay, um, this equity question, let's save that for the panel. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave your question up here and we will get into that on the panel because I have a feeling all of the guys are going to weigh in on this equity question. Okay. And okay. then someone asked about the spreadsheet. They can email you for the spreadsheet too, right? Sure. Okay, cool. You rocked it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm not even surprised. That was amazing. And honestly, that's why I love this meeting because I feel like we can go till midnight. I know I don't mind being here till midnight, but you guys have stuff to do. So <laughs> I have to find I have to find an ending point. But last meeting like really went on and on and on because it was so good. Um and I know this is gonna be like that too. So thank you so much for your time today. If you Absolutely. could stick around, we're gonna have a panel. Um, and maybe we can get into some of your owner financing information, but I think that you over delivered. It was amazing. And you guys make sure you tap in with him. I just put his email in the chat um, and make sure you find out what he's doing. I think someone asked about like connecting with you if they're in South Atlanta Rhea. Um, I know that you have taught at South Atlanta Rhea, right? You have a recorded yes. webinar with us. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you, um, so for those who are in South Atlanta Rhea, you can actually go and see his, wasn't it the good, bad, and ugly that you did? Yeah, I did a good, bad, and ugly with Stacey Rossetti back in January. And we had yes. some technical issues with my internet access at the time. So it was a little choppy and uh, the screen okay. share didn't work. So it, we still okay. muscled through it, but it, it went fine. All right, so after this, we're going to get ready for our next speaker. But when I leave, I'm going to message Stacy and I'm going to tell her the people want to hear more from Carson. We want Carson. So we'll see what else we could do with these. <laughs> so well, I'll the yeah, I'll let her know that that um, that people are asking. So fantastic. We're going to get ready for the next speaker. Um, but thank you so much. And then we'll get even more. We'll ask you a million questions in, in like an hour. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so you guys, who's ready for the next speaker? Um, let me give you, just give me a one. <laughs> give me a one in the chat. He's not coming until I see a gazillion ones. I need a good. Hello, guys. How you doing? I think I muted myself, too. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was about to say. You muted yourself out for a minute. <laughs> tell me. Oh, there we go. I wasn't even looking at the chat, so nobody could tell me. Right. <laughs> and I'm over here just talking. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this again. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Trevorrow Hardy, uh, someone that I have known uh, for years, seasoned investor here in Atlanta, Georgia. Super, super excited to bring him on. Um, I see the ones in the chat. Okay. <laughs> They're saying we can hear you now. Okay, cool. How are you doing, Mr. Hardy? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How about yourself, Deanna? Doing good, doing good. So happy to have you on here this afternoon. Um, I know this is going to be amazing. I'm going to give you the floor. Um, just a couple things. If you want to share your screen, just hover over the bottom. There's a green share screen button. 
and we'll be able to see. And then just make sure you click the square um, for you know whatever you're trying to share, and it'll only show that one window. Okay. And okay. You'll same button to unsquare and then um, unshare. And if you guys have um, any questions, put them in the chat so that we'll know they're for uh, Mr. Hardy and then we'll go from there. All right, cool, you've got the floor. Right. Thank you. Sounds good, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you for everyone that's on the panel here. Carson, I must say you did a fantastic job. I couldn't do it any better myself. <laughs> so that was fantastic, man. Um, I was actually going to touch on subject two, um, but Carson knocked it out the park, so I will leave that on him. <laughs> um, but I do want to go into my background, guys, tell you a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Trevor Hardy of HB Investor Firm. Um, I've been doing real estate investing now since 2003. Um, when I initially started, we used to do uh, expired listing campaigns. And what we would do, we would target homeowners that properties have been on the market for quite some time. Um, and when we got those properties, we would um, discount them. Most of the time, they had mortgages, in, and this revert to the subject, too. Um, and a lot of times, they were behind on payments. So what we did, we took them over to subject, two, and um, most of them needed, like, a light rehab, cosmetic, about five to ten grand. And what we would do then is fist them up, and um, then we'd retail sell them, or we would lease auction them out or do owner finances. So it just all depend on the, um, the area the territory area in which we uh, picked the property up in. So that's what we done back in 2003. Uh, moving forward, uh, what I used to do in 2006, 2007, we moved to the luxury home bidding sales event. Um, that's where we picked up a lot of luxury homes, half million dollar properties and above. And basically what we used to do with those, we did it what's called a seven day round robin bidding sales event. Um, that worked phenomenal. Um, you only had to do one or two of them a year and you were good because the profit margin on those was so large. Um, typically the profit margin on the luxury homes were anywhere between 50 to 100 to 200 grand. All right, so we did a couple of those um, in between 2006, 2007. Now the market crashed in 2008. So what we did back then um, in 2008 to 2009, we switched back over to subject twos, all right? Because again, there were homeowners that were falling behind. They didn't know what to do. The bank was threatening to foreclose. So what we used to do, we created a win-win for them and uh, we provided an outlet. Um, we did that, like I said, for a couple of years. And also we did a lot of owner financing then as well. Because keep in mind, a lot of homeowners, no matter what the market is doing, even right now, people have to have a place to stay no matter what. So people you know, may lose income, income may decrease, but at the same time, someone have to have somewhere to stay. So what we would do, we would get creative, all right? We would take these properties over subject to, or we would do a wraparound mortgage, all right? And then we would in turn sell them on lease option or on the finance, depending on the amount that the tenant buyer had to put down. So that's what we did around that time. Um, also another thing that we did to help homeowners, we did loan modifications. Loan modifications was very good. And even now, that's what we're gonna end up heading back into. Um, loan mods are going to be big. And the reason being is because a lot of people, um, again, decreasing income, falling behind on payment, doing deferred payments and all kinds of things due to the uh, COVID-19. Um, so loan modifications were big because a lot of homeowners want to stay in their properties. So what we would do, we would assist them on doing a loan modification. And during this period, they would be able to, of course, stay in their property. Um, we would apply like for a smaller interest rate. And we did charge them a fee for this. Um, keep it in mind of what they had, you know, so we didn't, we provided a solution and we charged a minimum fee to assist them in doing this. Um, so we did that as well. The loan modification worked out fine because we, we got homeowners uh, interest rate to decrease. All right. So that in turn helped them to be able to afford it. Um, and then we, like I said, we did a lot of um, tenant buying and, and a lot of lease option owner financing. Moving on up to 2010, we implemented wholesaling, which is, uh, of course, what a lot of us are doing right now, but things are going to change due to the market right now. So we did, in 2010, we started doing the wholesaling and JV wholesaling. Um, wholesaling is basically when you buy a property, all you guys probably know that's on the, on the call right now. Wholesaling is just when you buy a property for a, an amount and then you put it on the contract 
you turn around and sell it for two to 10 grand more, maybe even more depending on the profit margin and uh, the discount that you got on it. So we do a lot of that. We did a lot of that in 2010. Then the JV wholesaling is when you partner up with um, other investors such as Dwayne, um, Cato, or anyone that has a property that they are selling. It may not even be a wholesale deal. It can be a, a rental property. It can be an uh, Airbnb. It can be anything. I mean, it could be any type of properties, but basically you, you, you do a contract with that individual. All right. Once you do a contract with whoever that person is, such as Carson, Dwayne or whatever, then you, um, you market it to your buyers. So that's what JV wholesaling is. And, and, and we do a lot of that even now. And um, so we started that in 2010. All right. And, uh, and now where we are today, we do a lot of everything. So whatever comes in our pipeline, we can come up with a, uh, a strategy or a technique that, to help that homeowner out. So we're never just limited to one niche. It's, uh, it's so many different ways, so many different niches in the real estate business. So that's where we are today. And in our pipeline um, right now, due to COVID-19, what we are now implementing is um, I can tell everyone right now. So a question that I've gotten a lot is what are you doing during this period? Like, what are you doing, especially when we was in quarantine, what are you doing? Um, we never cease marketing. We never stop targeting homeowners because I feel like it's our job and our duty as real estate investors to help homeowners out. So even if we can't buy a property, at least we can put them on the right path to get them on a plan of action so that they would know what to do because a lot of homeowners don't know what to do in this market um, because of what they're going through, their job loss, et cetera. Um, so right now we, we never ceased in our market. So we do a lot of uh, campaigning. All right, we don't do postcards anymore. <laughs> you know, we used to do a lot of postcards, yellow letters and all that, but those days are to me over with. So we do a lot of text blasts, SMS, and then we do a lot of email blasts. So that's where we are today. So the, the, the list that we uh, target now, the, the, the list that we're marketing to, I know Carson said he don't use lists. So there are so many different niches, but we do use lists. We use them full fledged. I mean, that's all we do. We have multiple uh, different kinds of lists. We have the uh, probate list in which we purchased from Deanna. Great list. I'm going to show you, I'm going to share my screen uh, shortly here to show you all the results. I haven't even told Deanna about the results, but they're great results. The numbers are good. So uh, I'm going to share that shortly. But um, basically the list that we hit is absentee owners. All right. That's, that's one. We target the absentee owner list and a lot of people may not know what absentee owners are, but essentially what that is, is that's a homeowner. Um, when you look up the tax records, the mailing address is different from the street address or the property address. So that is considered an absentee owner. All right. Um, an out of state absentee owner is when that mailing address is out of state of where that property address is. So what happens is most of the time absentee owners are mostly motivated to to sell their property especially if it's vacant or if they're going through an eviction process with uh, their tenant buyers or um, whatever they may be going through a lot of time these empty homeowners are more motivated they're going to be more motivated than an than a average homeowner or a, 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 a occupied on homeowner property because they have two properties most of the time they have more than um, two properties sometimes so that's why we target these homeowners. Um, they are very motivated, and that's one of our lists that we use. Um, another list that we that we purchase is the vacant abandoned properties. All right, this is properties that have been deemed through the USPS as a vacant property due to uh, from the mail carrier. So these properties are vacant. A lot of times they have uh, tax liens against them. They have um, the code violation, all kind of violations against them. So we target those uh, abandoned property owners. Uh, most of the time, a lot of them, I mean, you know, believe it or not, we rented some properties that the homeowner didn't even know they owned it. They didn't even know that they still had it. They thought the city took it over. They thought the county bought them out or whatever because of intimate domain, things like that. So um, in those situations, those homeowners don't care like how much they get for the property, just give them anything. And, and at, at the same time, we're creating a win-win because we're helping them to get that property off their, off their shoulders. We're helping them with the liens that's against the property, tax lien, codes violation, whatever it is, to get it paid off. So we're creating a win-win 
and we're providing a solution for those homeowners. All right, another list that we target is right now is uh, the pre foreclosure list. All right, we've, uh, we've ran several campaigns because of what's going on, but not just that, but we have always implemented pre foreclosures just because that's a, a good list to hit. And a lot of these homeowners, um, most of them are just ready to throw the house away. You know, they get these letters from the, um, from the, the lender, you know, they may have a first and second mortgage on it. And so we may, you know, we may short that second mortgage so there'll be a little bit more equity in the property. Then we'll give the homeowner some money for moving expenses or whatever the case may be. Medical bills, there's just so many different reasons for homeowners to sell um, when they're in these situations in pre-foreclosure. So what we do is provide a solution for them in those situations. Um, and another a question that we got about the pre-foreclosure list, where do we get it from? There's a list source that we use that's very good and, um, and, and the list is, is producing great numbers. So if someone asks a question in the q and I'll, I'll definitely provide that um, or via email. So, um, but that, that's a great list, pre-foreclosure. And, and as I mentioned before, with these homeowners, a lot of times they don't know what to do. Um, they get these threatening letters from the lender um, and they don't know whether to just let them have it. They don't know anything about cash for keys. They don't know anything about how they can just stop the foreclosure process by filing bankruptcy. And that's just to halt it, you know, just so they can save their property and then come up with a strategy or technique or some type of outlet to sell that property. So it's just delaying it, but at the same time, giving them more time to get that property sold. So a lot of homeowners don't have this information and that's what we provide in regards to that. Um, another list that we target, of course, the probate. All right, we just started this back up. We used to do it years ago, the probate list um, that we purchased from Deanna. I partnered up with Carlos Carson on some of those and um, we, we did very well on those lists. And so now we just crank it up. We just crank another list up for that. Actually, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, May the 2nd, let me see if I can share my screen real quick, guys. Um, let's see here. All right, guys, can you see that, that screen there? All right, cool. All right, so this is a list, guys, that we just, that we just, um, that we just targeted. Like I said, we started this on May the 2nd. And with the results you can see here, let me just explain briefly here. This is, um, this is the, the program and software that we use for all of our mailing campaigns, all of our marketing. So basically what this has is, once I get to it, well, let me just scroll to the bottom just so you can see it here, the results. I don't wanna to go too far down. All right, so as you can see with this, with this uh, campaign, we just, just crunk it up here. This, the campaign side was 45, 41, all right? And this is the cost. We got it from Deanna um, when she was running the special. Out of the 41 leads that we had on this list, we generated 17 great leads. Out of the, the list itself, 41, we generated 17 leads. That's great. That's phenomenal. As you can see, the per percent, 41.5% rate return. That's phenomenal, guys. And, and what happens is right here, out of the 17, one of those leads right now, as of today, has been converted over to a property. And what that means is once we convert a lead over to a property, that means we have indeed purchased that property, all right, we have closed on it on our end, or we have it on a contract, and now we're marketing it to uh, our buyers, our tenant buyers, whatever the case may be, depending upon how we have structured this lead and uh, this property. All right, and then if I move back to the top, I can explain just a little bit more about my diagram here and the statuses. All right, so as you can see here, what this means is out of the 41, all right, there's five contact attempts, uh, contact attempt two. So what we do, the first thing we do when we get a lead, we do what's called an SMS broadcast, which is, which is a text blast, all right? Once we do that text blast, that's contact attempt one. Contact attempt number two is when we actually ourselves contact that homeowner via email, all right? So contact attempt one is the text, the text blast that we use. And we have a phenomenal template, guys. So 
you know, with this list, with the probate, I'm just going to horn in on this real quick. With this probate list, there's two reasons why we have gotten the results that we have. One is because the list provider, Deanna, the list is phenomenal. It's great, all right? That's one. Two is the template and the strategies and the technique that we use from our emails, our call script, as well as the, uh, the, the text blast template. Those are producing these results, all right? And now let me just move back into what the, the status means. So contact attempt to mean, all right, it's time for round two to text, I mean, to email these individuals. Five of them have been deemed dead, meaning they have expressed interest that they do not want to sell. However, with our campaign and our workflow and our marketing, what we do, once we mark a lead as dead, we still target that homeowner. We still contact them six, to, six months to a year later. All right, it's a dead lead. We understand it at that time. At this time, they don't want to sell. But one thing we do know in real estate, over time, time and everything, over time, things change, circumstances change. And when those circumstances change, you want to be in the face and in the presence of that homeowner when something changes. Right now, they didn't want to, they may not want to sell uh, because they may be planning on moving in it. And then whatever may happen down the road, they may change their mind. So that's why. We continue to do a drip campaign to these individuals that's considered as a dead lead, all right? So they're dead at the moment, but they can produce to be a lead during the follow-up process, all right? Um, research complete. What that means is that we have, we have contacted this homeowner, first of all, and it may be where they say they don't own it or they just signed it or quick claim it over to another individual. So at that point, we have to do a little bit more research, all right? We got to find out who this new owner is. We got to get their contact information to see, um, you know, get their contact information as far as their phone number, email address, so that we can contact them personally, as well as their mailing address. Even though we don't do postcards and yellow letters anymore, um, if we think it's a feasible deal, we may even just go to the door, you know, walk up to the door and let them know we're looking about this property. So it just that all depends on the deal and all of that kind of great information that we may get from the research being completed. All right, warm follow-up is just, we're gonna follow up with this individual every two, um, two weeks to uh, what we normally do, I think three months on that. That's what we normally do with the warm follow-up because that, what that means is we have spoken with this individual, they have mentioned that they do want to sell, but just not right now, all right? So if they mention they wanna sell, not right now, we put them on another, a, a separate drip campaign. And with that campaign, we just follow up with them more frequently. All right, and then this is um, the three, six, nine, 12 months follow-up is when a seller may say they want it, you know, they do want to sell, but they want more money than the value of the property itself. So at that point, we just put them on a three, six to nine, 12 months follow-up. Actively, that's just where we're actually dealing with this homeowner. And with this homeowner, we're, we're negotiating maybe the price, we're you know, negotiating um, how much they need to put in their pocket to walk away from, whatever the case may be. It is an active lead, meaning it is a great lead. It is, it's gonna produce income somewhat in the future, but we just don't know when because we're in the process of negotiating. All right, um, cold follow-up here means we have not touched bases with this homeowner. We have not made physical contact via text, email, nor over the phone. All right, so that's considered a cold follow-up. With the cold follow-up, we just follow up with them every three to six months. Uh, a period. So once we follow up with them, we just keep them on a drip campaign and eventually we will, hopefully we'll make contact with them. So that's considered a cold follow-up. Follow-up itself means myself, I have contacted this homeowner, my VA, my VA have reached out to them, gathered the necessary information and they've told me, hey, look, follow up with me in two weeks or follow up with me in three weeks and uh, I'll be ready to sell. So this is just an average normal follow-up. All right, and so that's what we do with these campaigns. Like I said, we have multiple campaigns. I just wanted to share that and let um, Deanna see that. Like I said, you can see the results here. Also, what I didn't mention, once this lead has, once we have sold this property, it's been converted into a lead. Once we sell it, that's when you will see all of this, all of these numbers will automatically fill in from what we um, put in the database. All right. And let me see, how do I get out of here? Okay, stop sharing. Um, but that, that's, that's it. That's just one campaign. And like I said, guys, we have multiple campaigns. 
and that's just one of them. And, and that's the most recent one that we're doing. Um, as I mentioned, we have several of them. All right. So we have several campaigns that we do. And um, that's just one of them. Like I said, the numbers are magnificent. I definitely wanted uh, Deanna to see that and um, let everybody know what we're doing. So that's pretty much all I have, just short and brief, to just let you guys know what's going on, what we're doing right now in the market. Um, currently, I don't have a huge presentation to present, but I did want to let everyone know what's working and what's working now. Um, another thing that I do want to mention, JVN. Um, JVN with, what we have also been doing is JVN with realtors. A lot of realtors have these properties on the contract or have it, you know, with the home on, have these contracts with them. And we JV with them. So a lot of people think you can't JV with a realtor. That's not true. You can JV with the realtor, put your fee on top and get paid in the process. Also, another thing that we're doing is JVing with um, homeowners that are looking to rent their property out, Airbnb, as well as lease options. So we're JVing with those as well. And we have a contract for all of that that we use. And um, it's working right now in the market, guys. Um, that's about all I have. If anyone, I'll let Deanna jump back on. Like I said, short and brief and to the point pretty much. <laughs> and that was fantastic. Do y'all see flames all around this uh, this Zoom? You set that thing on fire. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, yeah. guys. <laughs> Good. I was not expecting that, but that's what I like to see because at the end of the day, you know, we provide the information, but there's nothing like investors showing you, look, this is how I worked my list. And I've seen that where folks come to the table and they're like, Deanna, I got a list and I just froze. I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, no you can't do that you invested in it so thank you so much for really you gave us the game right if they were paying attention that's how you organize a marketing campaign and you don't hear that every day like folks say market folks say text folks say do this but you're like okay but how and I really feel like you gave us step by step so I can't thank you enough on behalf of everybody I see them going crazy in the chat um for that but thank you thank you so You're much welcome. <laughs> and congratulations to you. So, oh, yes. so you were saying the probate. So the probate deal. So you have that under contract, and you're you're getting ready to yeah. And that, that one. right, and, and and that's a good one, right? So um, with that with that probate, like I said, I didn't share, of course, the address and all the personal information on it, but mm -hmm. that one is scheduled to profit anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand on that deal. So, and you know. It's, it's a great list, guys. That's all I can say, hands down. Okay, that's fantastic. Now I'm about to hit you up. I need a testimonial. I need to hear I that story. So. I got you. Man, well, thank you for that pleasant surprise, y'all. I promise I did not know he was going to do I that. I thought he was. <laughs> I, I, no, I know you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, that's what I'm talking about. I just want to see y'all win, and I really appreciate you guys sending that. And also, I see some JV questions. Um, so you've made it clear, you know, if folks want to JV with you on a deal, they can. Um, right. Let me see if I can get one or two questions and then we'll bump the rest to the panel so we can get um, Keto on. So let's see. Um, okay, we got a lot of list questions. We'll kind of get deeper into list stuff. Um, we do provide the pre-foreclosure list. So if you really want a pre-foreclosure list, just go to lawclerkondemand.com, guys. Um, and then, okay, can you share details? I guess, can you clarify the JV? And then also, everyone's screaming, how do you get leads? That's so funny. And then <laughs> Airbnb, I guess you said something about JVing with an Airbnb. Right, right. Yeah, so basically when JVing is just simply having a contract with whoever have that property for sale or for rent. Um, we have we have a we have a um, contract for that. So if you guys email me, I email you the contract. Um, Deanna can share the information at the end or however she you know structure that. But um, yeah, we basically have a uh, an agreement that we place um, with that person that is marketing that property to sell it, and then you just make whatever you put on top of that. Or if that individual agreed to pay you a certain or set amount out of whatever price they're asking, then you're good there as well. Um, and that's pretty much all we do when it comes to JVN. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Okay. And that, that software you were using was FreedomSoft, right? Right. FreedomSoft, man. I mean, okay. he, I, I, you know, Tim, Tim uh, Harvey, he, he get on me all the time about it. He like, man, you just love FreedomSoft. I've been <laughs> uh, a user of FreedomSoft now for probably like when they first started about, man, I guess around 
10 or 15 years now. So I love it. I, I mean, everything is just in one, one location and um, it keeps up everything as far as the follow-up system, the drip campaigns, the mm -hmm. templates. The, I mean, we do everything out of it. The text blast, email blast, everything goes straight through FreedomSoft. And um, I'll be able to provide something about that as well too. So if anyone wants that info. info. Fantastic. And um, said uh, someone was clarifying, they were talking about Airbnb owners. And I will tell you guys, um, if you are trying to use Airbnb proposals or you want to like approach owners to approach folks about doing Airbnb, you really could work an eviction list is letting y'all know that that's where the landlords are. So if you want to use that as a strategy, that's something to consider too. Um, but I want to dive more into that. And then somebody else asked about software. Okay. So email him or reach out. What's your, um, your IG? Again, uh, real, is it okay, real estate hardy, real estate hardy or hardy BZ? Real estate hardy mm -hmm. and hardy BZ. BZ. And what's your email address? One second, you guys hold on. I'm going to type uh, it all out for you. And then email address. Georgia Homes, H as in Hardy, B as in Buyer, at Gmail. So Georgia Homes with the S H B at Gmail. Okay. All right, guys, just put that in the chat. Thank you so much, Mr. Hardy. You killed it as well. I'm nice, gonna save nice. this virtual assistant question for the panel. But thank okay. you so much for coming on. This was good. Can we give him some one, y'all? Can y'all show him some love? I mean, he gave y'all all the game. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's a blessing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. So uh, we're not even done, guys. Isn't that crazy? We're not even done. We still got two more speakers. Yep. So honestly, by the end of this, you should be a millionaire. Like if you don't, if you're not a millionaire by like three o'clock, <laughs> you weren't paying attention, right? You you was playing because honestly, between now Carson set it on fire, uh, Trevorrow set it on fire. Um, the next person that I'm bringing up, I listen. This is gonna be good. I see the ones in the chat. I need more ones. I can't bring them until there's more ones. Okay. The next person I am bringing up is Mr. Keto J Johnson. He is a superstar broker and investor here in Atlanta. Um, he runs Buy and Sell Inc. right here in Atlanta. He has his own meetup, um, his own mentoring and things that he does. Um, one of the first meetups that I ever went to, he let me go in there and, and talk about law clerk on demand. I was so nervous. I literally remember that moment. <laughs> I was like, would you mind? I had these little thin business cards. I was brand new and Keto was so nice. Um, and that's really his personality. Um, so I asked him to come <laughs> and they said, Keto, the king thing of Atlanta real estate, Johnson. Okay. So you need to update your IG to that. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome. Let me make sure. Are you unmuted? Can you, can you hear and see? Okay, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay, guys, get ready. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Keto. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Deanna. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday with us. I am going to go ahead and mute out and I'll let you take the floor. Absolutely. I want to thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank Stacy and her absence for everything that she does with South Atlanta Rhea and the value that she provides and that you all provide to so many different people uh, all around this area and abroad. So thanks so much. I, I consider this an honor. It's an honor to be able to follow uh, great presenters like Carson and like Trevorrow. I salute you guys for the great work that you're doing and the folks that you're helping out here. And uh, my brother Dwayne is coming up just after me. I'm always uh, excited to work with Dwayne, to talk to Dwayne, to have opportunities to share on platforms with Dwayne. He's a tremendous guy and I appreciate him. So let's jump right in. Uh, Deanna, you asked me to talk about uh, short sales. And so I'll spend a few moments talking about short sales. And you also asked me to talk about branding. Uh, maybe I'll save some of that branding conversation or question for the Q&A session at the end. But what I want to do real quick is try to share my screen so we can get in the short sale conversation. 
So if you can see, can you see my screen? All right. We can see you. You can see me? You can see short sale profits? Yes. All right, fantastic. All right, so let's jump right in. We're talking about short sales and short sale profits. And um, I believe that short sales is one of the often overlooked strategy that many wholesalers seem to miss out and leave a lot of money on the table over and over. And I'll, I'll share with you why I believe that is as we get into the presentation today. Uh, but my name is Keto Johnson and I'm glad to be here. This is what we're going to talk about. This is what my 22 minute agenda looks like. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm going to tell you what my greatest passion in real estate investing is. I'm going to define short sales for you. I'm going to answer some frequently asked questions. So I have about 18 frequently asked questions. And I think as we go through those FAQs, uh, you should have a really clear understanding of what short sales are. And uh, if, I, if I present well enough and I answer all of your questions, that means you might not have any questions later on for me. Um, but I'm certainly, uh, certainly open to whatever you have, all right? And then I wanna give you a free uh, ebook that I've prepared called how, uh, how Not to Lose Money in Real Estate. You know, everybody talks about how to make money, but I, I wrote an ebook called The 10 Biggest Mistakes That Most Investors Make, How Not to Lose Money in Real Estate. So I'll provide that for you and tell you how to get that at the end. And lastly, I'll share with you how you can contact me. So who am I? Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I've been doing something around entrepreneurship since I was age nine when I was selling candy at school and running a uh, lawn service after school. Uh, I'm a seasoned investor. Uh, most people ask me, Keto, exactly what is it that you do? And I say, I started investing when I was 20. I acquired my first property at 20 years old. Uh, I'll actually be 43 this July. So I've been doing this 23 years. I've been a full-time investor since 2004. I'm considered an authority on real estate. And so I've been featured in a number of different places, not the least of which is Black Enterprise and CNN Magazine or CNN uh, Television. Uh, and I'm also a best-selling author. Uh, the, I've written several books, but the book that actually made me an Amazon bestseller is entitled Real Estate Wealth how to remove the guesswork from investing and how to create a six figure strategy. After mentoring and training and coaching and teaching people for uh, 20 years, I decided to write this book because I realized and I noticed a common theme over the years. And that, that is the common theme of confusion. A lot of people try their hands at a lot of things when it comes to real estate investing. The reality is, there's a whole lot of ways to make money in real estate. And you're hearing about quite a few of those ways on today's training. And when you walk away after three hours of sitting here, you will have so many notes that you can implement, but we really wouldn't have scratched the surface of the opportunities that are available in this industry. And so what I realized was after training folks, there were a lot of people who came to me and one day they were trying short sales and the next day they were trying wholesaling and the next day they were fixing and flipping. And then the next day they were doing tax lien, right? Every time I saw them, they were doing something different and they couldn't quite understand why they weren't seeing great success like so many other people around them were. And in my opinion, oftentimes it has to do with the fact that we jump at a strategy without first taking a step and asking ourselves, what strategy makes sense for our life based on where we are today? Based on my time, my money, my credit, where should I invest myself and how should I invest those resources today? It doesn't mean that I need to stay at that place, but it is to ask ourselves, what is the entry point? Where do I start as an investor and how do I grow from there? And when you determine where the best place for you to start is, that's what determines uh, where you should place all of your energies and your focus, at least for that season in your business. And that's what real estate wealth is all about, helping you choose the strategy that makes the most sense for you. Okay, so you can go to Real Estate Wealth Bestseller and check it out. It's on Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. There's plenty of places you can pick up the book, all right? Uh, this is a screenshot of my website. And the reason I show this is because I wanna really talk to you just for about 39 seconds about my, what my real true passion is. 
people say, Keto, what do you do? And I often respond by saying, if it has to do with residential real estate, I either do it or have done it. So that's why I can write real estate well, because I've wholesaled before, I still do it. I've done a number of short sales, I've fix and flip, I buy and hold, I've done tax liens, I've done new construction, I've done full renovations, uh, you name it. If it has to do with residential real estate, I either do it still or have done it at some point in my career, inclusive of credit repair and uh, having a mortgage brokerage. So I've got the experience, but what I'm most passionate about is buying and holding real estate. And so I have a number of different online courses, training courses, et cetera, but I mentor individuals who want to buy and hold real estate for long-term generational wealth, for the creation of pa uh, passive income and cash flow. So I help new and seasoned real estate investors add a quarter of a million dollars to their net worth within a year while creating monthly passive income. So you can quit your day job if you want to, all right? And so if you go to my website, ketojjohnson.com, I have a no, whole new, another training on, on that specifically. Uh, you can get that training free if you go to my website, ketojjohnson.com. So my assignment today is to talk about short sales. And again, Deanna, thank you for this opportunity and for giving me this assignment. I do also enjoy short sales and I'll share with you why. The first thing I wanna do is make sure we're on the same page, that we have an understanding of what a short sale is. A short sale is when an individual is upside down on a property that they desire to sell, okay? So if the house is worth $100,000, and they owe $120,000, then that might be a candidate for a short sale. The other thing that makes it a candidate for a short sale that's important, that is essential, is that that individual is in arrears on their payment. They have to be at least 30 days behind on their more, uh, monthly payment for a bank to consider a short sale. It is called a short sale because what literally happens is the bank uh, after a series of negotiations, a bank is willing to sell the property short of what the actual mortgage is. So if they sell it for a hundred and the mortgage, the, the mortgage, the individual who owns a house owes 120,000, then they're selling it short of the full balance of, of the full payoff. All right. So that is the definition of a short sale. Now, let me ask, answer this question. Again, I said I have about 17 frequently asked questions. So I'm gonna walk through each one of those and hopefully answer everything that's lingering in your mind right now about a short sale. The first thing is why would a lender consider selling a mortgage short? A lender would sell the mortgage short quite simply to avoid foreclosure. Remember, I told you that the individual who owns the house has to be at least one payment behind. All right, so if the individual is one payment behind at least and headed toward a foreclosure potentially, then the lender will consider a short sale. If this individual says to the lender, you know what, uh, I owe more on this house than it's worth, uh, I'm having some challenges making the notes, I want to wash my hands of it and move on, but I want to av avoid a foreclosure, they will consider a short sale. A lender will consider a short sale because foreclosure costs them money. It costs them money. Not only does a foreclosure cost them money, but uh, more times than not, most loans have some sort of insurance on them anyway. So if a lender does a short sale, at the end of the day, it's not really that lender that's losing out. It's the individual who has the insurance that is backing the property. Okay, so uh, a lender will consider a short sale because for every dollar that a, a lender has loaned out, there is a certain amount of credit line that is available from the feds to that lender. And so for every non-performing asset that is on their books, and if they have a house where the mortgage payments aren't being paid, that's a non-performing asset. So for every non-performing asset that is on their books, they get penalized uh, from, uh, from a hierarchy perspective as it relates to the amount of money that they still have available to lend. So they want to get these properties off their books 
And oftentimes doing a short sale as opposed to a foreclosure is not only cheaper for them, but in some cases it's quicker for them. All right. Second question is who is a good candidate for a short sale? Well, I kind of answered that already. An individual that is behind on their mortgage payment and also an individual who has a home that if were to list it on the retail market um, to attempt to at least break even, they're upside down. So the likelihood is uh, they would not be able to sell going the traditional route without implementing a short sale in the process. So that is a good candidate for a short sale. Why short sale should be in a wholesaler's tool bag. Uh, and I share this with wholesalers on a regular basis, right? Uh, I believe short sales should be in your tool bag simply because I see a lot of wholesalers who spend plenty of money marketing. You market for these deals, you follow up on these deals. When you finally get a phone call, you go out and you meet with the sellers. Uh, you run the numbers, you ask them what they need to break even, et cetera, et cetera. And when you run up against a property where the numbers just don't work, most wholesalers put that, file that lead away uh, in a cabinet that says, uh, that's a dead deal. Whereas if you add short sales to your tool bag, as opposed to throwing that lead away because the numbers didn't work, if they're at least one mortgage payment behind, there's a great likelihood that a short sale can be applied, that we can negotiate a discount on the sale of the house and it still becomes a win-win for everybody. The wholesaler can still move forward with that deal in some way or another. The individual that you built rapport with uh, can, uh, can walk away from the deal, et cetera. All right, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I absolutely think that wholesalers, especially you wholesalers, and I hate to use the term, I hate to say it like this, uh, but I'll say it, especially the real wholesalers who aren't just sending out everybody else's deal, but if you have your own deals that you have pounded the pavement for, that you have marketed for, that you have built relationship with the seller for, uh, you need to include this as a part of your strategy, okay? What does a short sale consist of? Well, uh, just to say it in simple terms, a short sale consists of a lot of paperwork and a lot of going back and forth with the bank, making sure that I's are dotted and that T's are crossed and communicating with the bank to get them what they need, the way that they want it, when they want it, all right? So once the short sale paperwork, the process, the application is submitted, uh, or that packet is submitted to the bank, then there's a series of valuations and inspections that the bank will do with the property physically and even on the back end. Uh, there's a system of evaluations that they have to go through. If the property has uh, a, a uh, insurance, a mortgage insurance provider, then they have to get involved and you have to work through that process with them as well. So uh, it's a lot of paperwork that has to happen. Uh, and uh, I'll break some of that down also. The next question then becomes how long does the short sale process take? Now, I've been doing this for a very long time and I've had short sales as a part of my tool bag for a very long time, all right? And as a real estate broker, I didn't say that up front, but I'm a real estate broker. I've got over 1,000 real estate transactions behind me. Uh, my team and I have done uh, a quarter of, quarter of a billion dollars in real estate just in the last few years. So I've got a whole lot of experience and a part of that experience includes the short sale process, all right? And I have one short sale that I was able to go from start to finish in 30 days. In 22, 23 years, I've been short, doing short sales since about 16 years. Uh, but in 16 years of experience, one deal I got done in about 30 days. That's a miracle. Don't expect that to happen. The reality is the average short sale takes about four months. And the longest short sale that I ever negotiated uh, took 18 months to get processed and closed. So it's about a four month process, okay? What if the property is in foreclosure? What if the property is in foreclosure? 
Uh, this is a good, good question because a lot of times people call me three days before the auction and say, we want to do a short sale. If you wait three days before the auction, yeah, it's not impossible, but it's a 95% chance that a short sale is not going to be possible because you're not going to have time to stop the foreclosure process. When a property is in foreclosure, that's a different department in the bank. That's a whole different negotiation uh, loss mitigation stream at the bank, all right? A short sale is a different stream. So it, a property cannot be in both areas of the bank or in both systems at the bank at the same time. You can't be in foreclosure and actively negotiating a short sale at the same time. If you start the process soon enough, you, you should start a short sale process before a foreclosure date is actually set. That's best case. That's, that's the better way to handle it. However, if a foreclosure date has already been set, the farther away you are from that foreclosure date, the better time you have, the better op opportunity you have to stop the foreclosure. Because basically what your facilitator, short sale facilitator has to do is get the short sale paperwork prepared and submitted to the bank and get it at least preliminarily, re uh, preliminarily, preliminarily, if that's even a word, reviewed so that they can then communicate with the foreclosure department and get permission to stop the foreclosure sale, okay? Now, just as a side note, somebody, I think it was Trevorrow, somebody earlier mentioned the, the bankruptcy option. And that, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. I will say that I have had, and most recently, just in the last few months, uh, we, have a short, we have a short sale that's approved that's gonna be closing next week. And this is a scenario where the foreclosure was just a couple of days away. The loss mitigation department said, we're not going to cancel the foreclosure. And the homeowner said, well, okay, I know what to do. So he went down and filed bankruptcy, which stopped the foreclosure. And then after the foreclosure sale, he canceled or terminated his bankruptcy pro process, which was all of his own doing. He decided, nah, I don't want to do a bankruptcy anymore. And then we started the short sale process. And so the house avoided foreclosure. We've been through the negotiation process. It's taken us about three and a half months and we should close the deal on next week, all right? Mm -hmm. How will a short sale affect the seller's credit? Always a question that we get uh, from a seller in particular, and that's a great question. Uh, a short sale is going to have an impact, uh, a, a not so positive impact on the seller's credit. However, the impact is going to be, as I've understood for years, is that the impact is not as bad. It does not look as bad as a foreclosure, all right? It, it indicates that the individual, that the homeowner was willing to do whatever it took to take the necessary steps to avoid foreclosure. And so it then shows on the credit as like a settled account uh, in most cases, all right? What condition should the house be in? What condition should the house be in? Well, I'll say it like this since I'm talking to a group of investors. Most investors want to get the property for the best deal possible. If you want to get the property at the best deal possible, then, then consider that when the appraiser or the evaluator that the bank orders goes out and looks at the property, consider this with me. The worse the house looks, the better chance you're going to get at a lower evaluation. All right. Uh, take that for what it's worth. If you, you got a property that's in tip top clean condition, short sale still works. It still works every day of the week. But the reality is you just might not get to the number that you want to get to as an investor buyer. OK, so that's important to note. How much does a short sale cost the seller or the investor? All right, so I'll talk about short sale facilitation in a moment, but the truth is most times, at least when, if you work with us, it costs you absolutely nothing unless the deal is approved. If the deal is approved and we're ready to go to the closing table, then sometimes, not all the time, and it's, it's one of those you know, real estate answers, the real real estate answer to any question is it depends, all right? Uh, but 
If there is a short sale facilitation fee, then that's included at the sale of the home and you're able then to factor those numbers into your desired purchase price up front. So that's the first thing you need to know. The second thing is nobody pays anything um, until we get to an approval, right? And go to a closing table and we wouldn't get to the closing table if the numbers didn't work for you. The third thing is the seller never has to pay anything. And, the, and I should say it like this, there, I've heard that there are some companies that do charge you fees up front. I would tell you to really investigate those companies and be careful if you choose to go that route. But with the processes that we use, nobody spends any money out of their pocket um, from an investor or seller perspective until we get to the very end of the process and everybody likes the numbers and we go to the closing table, okay? So it's really no loss at all involved in this process. Here's the great question here. Can the seller make any money at the closing table? The answer usually to this question is no. Because remember that the short sale lender is selling the property short. So if they're taking a loss on the property, oftentimes they are not going to be willing to allow the seller to get any money at the closing table. Usually the seller side of the settlement statement says zero. Now, about 50% of the time, we are able to get some sort of relocation incentive for the seller, all right? And I think I have another question coming up about whether the house should be vacant. If I don't, remind me later to answer that question, right? But uh, about 50% of the time, we can negotiate a relocation incentive in for, or some sort of hardship incentive in for the seller. And about what we always ask for it. But about 50% of the time, we, uh, we're successful at getting that. So I usually, most times when I'm working with, a, with, with an investor or a seller in particular, I just set them up from the very beginning to understand that, you know, we're going to help you walk away and wash your hands and help do some uh, uh, salvaging to your credit. Uh, I would not expect to get any money at the closing table. And, and that's usually how we handle that conversation and then we'll come back and maybe surprise them with something at the end. Now, that's my answer as a real estate broker, all right? Now, I do and have heard of investors who will say to the seller, uh, I can't give you anything at the closing table, but if you leave that 30-year-old refrigerator in the house, after closing, I'll give you $1,500 because I just really love that refrigerator. And so I will buy it from you for 1500 bucks, right? So I've seen or heard of things like that from the past. But at the closing table on the settlement statement, usually the seller walks away with no money, okay? Should the house be vacant? Yeah, here's that question. Should the house be vacant during the short sale process? Um, my answer, especially when I'm talking to a seller, my answer to this question is, why have it vacant? Why have it vacant? Don't move until you have to move. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen people in a hardship type situation where they say, oh, I'm going through a short sale. I better get out. And they move. And then it takes us nine months to negotiate the short sale. That's nine months that you could have potentially been staying in that house, not paying any mortgage, because all collection activities have stopped while we're negotiating. So you could be living there nine months stacking up cash while we're going through the negotiation process. So my suggestion is don't move out until we get an approval letter. When we get an approval letter, we're gonna have on average 30 days, at least 30 days to close the deal. So don't rush out of the house, okay? So uh, that's a very important to understand. Can you wholesale a short sale? Can you wholesale a short sale? Now, here is something that every investor needs to be clear on. And I make this clear to every investor that I work with throughout this process. You cannot, uh, you cannot assign a short sale. Can't happen. 
All right. So the assignment deal is off the table completely. Now you may be able to double close a short sale. You may be able to. Uh, now that may has to do with who the closing attorney is on the buyer's end. There's a there's there's some nuances along with that. But the biggest nuance that you need to be aware of, as it relates to a double close with a short sale, is most times, really all the time, we don't know if that's a possibility until we get the approval letter. When the bank does all of their research, all of their investigations, all of their reviews, inspections, et cetera, when they review all of our paperwork over and over and over and finally say, okay, here's what we approve, they will send an approval letter. And that approval letter will specify how much they're willing to take, what their net needs to be on the settlement statement. It details all of that information. Sometimes in the approval letter, there is a statement that says this house may not be resold for X number of days. Sometimes there is a stipulation in the approval letter that says this house cannot be resold for say 120 days, but if it's sold sooner than that, it can only be sold for 5% or 10% more than the purchase price in this approval letter, all right? So that's one of those things that we really don't know until we get the approval letter. And one of the things that I share is, I really, somebody says, well, why don't you just ask them? Well, because I don't wanna throw up red flags at the beginning of the process. I don't wanna call the bank and say, hey, if we get this approved for 80 grand, are we gonna be able to sell it for 90,000 the same day? So we don't even deal with that. We deal with it when we get the approval letter. And once we get the approval letter, then the investor has to decide, do I still want to move forward with whatever your exit strategy was? If you were buying it to hold, then go ahead. If you were buying it to fix and flip, then go ahead. But if you were buying it to wholesale it or double close it, then you might have to reconsider, all right? And you might have to move on at that point and let someone else step up to the plate and buy the deal. I have had deals so good uh, that negotiated out so well that I've had investors buy the property knowing that it had that stipulation in it and they sat on it until that time period expired. And then they sold the house and they profited and made money. So it's one of those situations where you just kind of have to walk it out, walk the process out. And I will say in my most recent experience, in the last uh, year or so, maybe 30% of the short sales that we, no, I wouldn't say that, maybe 20% of the short sales we've negotiated had a stipulation in it that said you, you have to wait a period of time before you can resell. Why is a short sale facilitator so important? It's very simple. There's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of phone calls to the bank. It's a lot of crossing of T's and dotting of I's. Um, it's a very bureaucratic process and it takes a lot of time, all right? And most investors, you have to ask yourself what's your highest and best use. You probably could negotiate it on your own. There's a likelihood that you would make a lot of mistakes the first few times till you got up to speed. But even if you did get up to speed, is it worth your time doing it, right? Most investors, wholesalers in particular, who bring us their short sales to negotiate, move on, continue their daily business. And I've even had situations where folks forgot they even gave us a deal to negotiate. And I've called uh, the, the, the individual and said, all right, we got that short sale approved. And they say, oh man, I didn't even remember that. <laughs> like, really? Okay, well, let me see if the numbers still work. And then they move forward and do the deal or they walk away. It's one of those things that you just put in your pipeline and you keep doing business the way you do business until it's time uh, and, until it, it's negotiated. I don't know how much time I got left, but I think I got maybe three or four more minutes. Am I good, Deanna? Yes, I think you have a few questions in your um, Q&A box. Okay. In the Q&A box for you. you want All me right, to start so, reading them out? Or? Yeah, let me, let me rush through these because I still might answer them. Um, okay. Real quick, what, what, does an, what role does an attorney play? An attorney has to be on board from the beginning. 
because an attorney has to pull title and do all of those things with the understanding that they're not going to get paid either until closing happens. So you need to be on board with a good attorney. What role does a real estate broker play? When you're negotiating a short sale, a bank requires that the house is listed. So either way it goes, you're going to have to partner with a real estate brokerage in the process. All right, how can a wholesaler pivot the conversation and introduce the short sale option? If you're a wholesaler and you have built rapport with the seller, you come to a place where it doesn't work for you at those numbers, you simply have a brief conversation that says, I've partnered with XYZ firm, we think this is a great candidate for a short sale. This particular firm does all of those negotiations for us. Let me tie you in with three-way call. You get that person, maybe someone from my team on the phone, and you, you shift that conversation then to a short sale conversation, and our team picks up from there. What role does Buy and Sell Inc. play? Buy and Sell Inc. is my company. We have everything in-house. We have a facilitator in-house. We have a, uh, uh, an attorney that we work with that does all of our foreclosure, I mean, all of our short sale negotiations and title searches. And of course, we're the real estate brokerage that lists those properties. I don't just teach this stuff. I also do it. This is a short sale. I bought this house for $125,000. That was my original offer to the bank on the short sale. They came back and said, we won't take less than $155,000. Uh, $155, we countered them, gave them some additional reports. They came back and approved our $125,000 offer. I renovated and sold it and walked away from the closing table with just over six figures. As I promised for sticking with me to the end, go to bit.ly forward slash creative deals 101. And there you can download my PDF document, how not to lose money in real estate, the 10 biggest mistakes new investors make. All right. And there's my contact information. I'll take questions now or later. It's up to you, Deanna. Okay. I think we can, um, Let's see if we covered any of them. First of all, fantastic presentation. Once again, look at them going crazy in the chat. Can we get some ones for Keto as we as I pull up his questions? That was fantastic. Um, awesome. Someone said, can you click back to the free PDF? Yes. There we go. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. So... Uh, um, there was a, a, he said that a lot of people are still proponents for yellow letters. Are you sure there's no market for letters? What about baby boomers? Uh, I believe that, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a question specific to me around short sales, but uh, I think there's still right. a market for yellow letters and also, uh, also postcards. The reality is it, it, with everything in marketing, in business in general, you kind of got a split test. And when you find what works for you, stick with that and stop deviating and trying all this other stuff. When you find what works, stick with that. And I know people that yellow letters are still working for, that postcards are still working for, that SEO campaigns are still working for, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, we got two more. So as a wholesaler, do we contact and negotiate with the bank? No, well, you, you can try. Um, you can try or you can partner with someone like us or like our firm. Uh, we completely facilitate it from beginning to end. So as a wholesaler, what literally happens, uh, we have four, three or four active deals that we're negotiating right now for wholesalers. Wholesalers know that we do this. They call me, they say, I got this deal. I say, how much you want to buy it for, right? They tell me how much, how much they want to pay for it. Then we pick up from there. They do the trend, they, they facilitate the shift or the pivot of the call. They introduce us to the seller as their partner in short sale negotiations. And then we pick up from there. So we have somebody on our team that all he does is uh, facilitates, he handles the negotiation uh, process with the banks. Very good, very good. And then the last question we have. And then we'll we'll roll the rest into um, into the Q and A section. But um, the last one is: Can you buy the short sale with an LLC and then sell the LLC? Uh, that's a good question, and I've had the, that as a consideration before. And again, I'm not an attorney. I'm not a CPO, a CPA rather. But if you buy the company or buy the property in an LLC and you sell that company, 
then from my perspective, that property wasn't sold. You sold the entity that owned the company. So I don't see why not. Right. Thank you for that. Um, all right, guys, give Keto some ones in the chat. I do want to say, um, I do need to give my disclaimer and then I'm going to make a comment to Keto. Um, yes, you guys, normally I say it in the beginning. So no part of this panel is legal advice or financial advice. While every single person on here is a rock star and a seasoned investor, uh, sometimes the questions get very specific and I don't want you to take what um, any investor in any setting um, says to you as, you know, this is the law. You really need to have a conversation with an attorney. Um, I know who Keto's attorney is. Keto's attorney is my mentor. <laughs> Thanks to Keto. Um, so, you know, actually, you know, make sure that you build a relationship with an attorney. That's so important and have that conversation um, because, you know, things change and you could be in another state and you're asking a Georgia investor what you can and cannot do, right? So um, I'm so happy that Keto said that. Uh, Keto, thank you so much for your time today. That was fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you. I look yes. forward to the Q&A at the end. I know. I was going to say, I know, know folks have even more questions for you. Um, so if you could stick around, we're going to bring Mr. Murray on. Um, and then I'm, we're going to roll back into your questions. Because uh, I really wish we, this could be like a whole boot camp do this like a nine to five yeah. <laughs> but I have to you know roll on but thank you so much for your time that was fantastic I know I learned today and people were commenting saying they're learning so much information so thank you awesome you're welcome okay cool all right you guys are y'all ready we still got one more person if you're still with me put a one in the chat I need to see some ones I can't bring Mr. Dwayne Murray unless there's like a million ones in the chat let's go people wake up wake up let's go there we go and don't be sending me your one privately you need to put it in all panelists and all attendees <laughs> ones in the chat there we go there we go listen you guys um i told y'all this is going to be like off the chain i told you you were going to be a millionaire by 3 p.m at least you'll have the information to get you there right so the next person i'm bringing I got a story for everybody, right? So I met Dwayne Murray when I first started my business, probably within months of meeting Keto and meeting Mr. Hardy. Like I met everybody <laughs> kind of in the same year. And I used to say to him, and I still run into him in real estate meetings, but I used to say, okay, I know I'm working hard if I keep running into Mr. Dwayne Murray. Cause see, he is someone you're gonna, if you're really doing this business, you're gonna see him in real estate meetings. You're gonna be getting emails from him with deals he's doing deals all over the United States. Like he's everywhere, right? Always working. So please turn your volume up. Help me welcome Mr. Dwayne Murray. Okay. Can we get some ones for him? Somebody called you dynamic Dwayne Diggity Murray. That's Wilson. He got a name for everybody. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> he does. <laughs> welcome. How are you? Thanks so much for coming on. I'm well. How are you? Good, good, good. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to hear what you have today. Uh, please take your time. I know I messed the schedule up a little bit, but <laughs> we're gonna do your presentation and then go. Into I'll, I'll make mine shorter, shorter, so you know we can, you know, give it to the people that ask questions. I, I, I won't, you know, go that deep into to to mine. So <laughs> take your time. Take your time. All right, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Thank uh, Stacy. I, I knew, I've known Stacy since she first started. Um, it was years ago. Uh, her, Frank Iglesias, myself, and several other uh, investors. We we had uh, we had our own like I guess meetup or whatever that we used to do years ago. And I've known Stacy for a long time. So when when I speak with her or you speak with her, tell her I'll say thank you. Um, I've known Keto. <laughs> Keto and I have a, a story, <laughs> a story to tell. Um, I won't go into details about it, but I've known Keto 
for quite a while as well. Um, Keto will tell you that I'm the person who never hired him. <laughs> That's the long and the short of the end of the story. Carson, I, I've seen before. I've never met him in person before, but I've definitely seen him around in different events and stuff like that. Trevorrow, we're 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 close. Trevor and I are close to getting the deal done. <laughs> Hopefully, so. Um, but you know, anybody who knows me knows that I, I like to network. I like to, you know, I'm a, a people's person, and I like to um, do different things. Um, just to give you a background for from myself, um, I started real estate probably back in 2008, 2009. Started learning um, different techniques and and understanding about real estate. What got me introduced to real estate was Dave Ramsey. He said uh, more millionaires are made in real estate than any other industry. So at that point, when I started uh, learning from Dave Ramsey back in 2007, I became debt free. Then I learned about real estate and different techniques. Um, I've been to like the Trump seminars. I've learned from um, Ron LeGrand, from Larry Goings, uh, Sean Terry. I mean, I'm still learning, you know, even as we speak. Um, and where I learned creative financing from was um, a guy named Chris Kirstner, who used to teach here in Georgia. Um, I, don't, I don't think he's out of the industry totally now. So um, I even used the, the attorney that he used to use, Harlan Associates, here to do all of my, specifically, I use them uh, just specifically for my creative type deals. Um, so in... Strangely enough, my very first deal was a creative deal. It was a subject two that I wholesale to another um, uh, owner occupant down in LaGrange, Georgia back in 2010 was when I did my first, very first deal. But to, to go back, um, back in when I first started, most of my deals when I was wholesaling or mainly wholesaling was, um, I used to buy property off of MLS uh, and then wholesale it, you know, the same day or the next day, got them real cheap and sold them cheap just as well. And then uh, back in 2013, I went full time. Um, I left my job at at t which I was there for 13 years and started uh, real estate uh, since then or full time since 2013. I've been doing since then I uh, wholesale, I rehabbed, um, done creative deals. The house that I previously lived in was a subject to deal. The house I live in now is a subject to deals because I still don't have, like Dave Ramsey, I still don't have anything personally in my name, um, any credit in my name whatsoever. So, and I stand by that that um, that that belief. Uh, let's see, what else about me? Um, I've wholesaled properties in I think six different states, um, Ohio, Maryland, um, I still own a property in Illinois that I've never seen. I paid 15000 for back in 2013 or 14. Um, Georgia, of course. Um, in North Carolina, it seemed like it's another state somewhere. So I've, you know, I've wholesaled properties that I've never seen before. And, you know, and I even own a property to this day I still, I've still never seen um, as well. But one day, I guess this year or maybe next year, I'll go and take a look at it. But I really don't care. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see, as far as um, creative deals, uh, my very first deal was a deal down in LaGrange, Georgia. I used to work with uh, the guy, this guy who uh, used to bring me leads from Chris Kirstner's program. And and just speaking to the, the lady, she was in a situation where she couldn't afford the house anymore. She wasn't behind on any payments or anything like that, but she was just ready to move here to Atlanta and she was living down in LaGrange. So I told her like, look, this is, she, what it was is she owed like eighty eighty nine thousand dollars on the property, and she wanted to somebody just to come in and take over the payments. I told her the amount that she owed on the house was too much for me to pay cash. So what I could do is start making the payments on uh, for you on your behalf, and then um, then you can just walk away from the property. So she said, fine. So what I did was I, I put the property under contract and then I assigned my contract to a, a young man who wanted to move into the house for himself, for him and his, his daughter at the time to, uh, to live in the house. So what I did was um, that contract, I signed it and I put a clause in there that he would have to get another mortgage within two years in order for that that property not to be in that lady's name anymore because God didn't want to take the chance of him, you know, prolonging or being in the property and anything can happen over a prolonged period of time, especially since I wasn't staying in the deal. 
So then after that two years, he gave me $5,000 um, at the closing. So I made $5,000. He, and I think I gave her, I think $1,000 or something like that. So she could move here to Atlanta. So really I made $4,000 off of that deal. And then two years later, what he did was he had to go and refinance the property in which he did. And she moved on with her life. Um, here, I've done some uh, lease options. I've even, uh, matter of fact, it's a property, I think that Deanna saw that I put on, um, on Instagram that I was at, we were fixing up that we we're doing, in a sense, a burr method. We bought it, we uh, repaired it. And right now we're doing a rent to own with the um, person that we have into that property. So that's another creative type deal. And we're taking the money after six months, we're gonna take the money out of that property and put it into another property. Um, yeah, it was on the live. Um, and let's see, what else? And I mean, I've done different type of creative deals throughout uh, my, um, my um, time in the real estate industry. And um, matter of fact, the, um, there's a house that I'm working on now. It's, it's a uh, owner finance type deal. The owner owns the house free and clear. And we're just trying to work out the, the numbers. It's a property in Gwinnett County. He has two, one with his family and one by himself. Both of them, he doesn't have time because he's always on the road. So he doesn't have time to, to deal with the property. Both of the properties are free and clear. One, they want more money than I'm willing to pay cash for the property. So what we're doing is we're trying to work out the terms of the deal in order to, to get it done for both of our parts. Um, his family, they're wanting $120,000 for the property. And the most I can pay for the property is 90,000 cash. So I'm working with him to see how much they're willing to take down for the property right now. I'll put in probably about 10 to 15,000, either rent it out or rehab it and then resell the property. It's in the Parkview school district. So it's in a, great school district so I know the property will move either way either way quickly so I'm not concerned about that he has another property that he owns free and clear that's in his personal name he doesn't want to sell the property right now because he's uh, deducted all of the um, uh, I forgot the terminology the, uh, the taxes every year um, he depreciated the property for the last I think he's last 20 something years that he's owned the property so he doesn't want to pay all of that taxes if he was to sell the property all at once so we're working out a way now to structure it so he doesn't have to um, pay all of that at once so we're going to probably stretch it out for probably about a 10 to 15 year um, mortgage that he's going to give to me and then I uh, either in turn rent it out or do uh, a lease option on the back end of that deal in order to um, to sell the property. Preferably, I, I probably will keep it long term because it's in a, a, a pretty good school district and the value that I would be getting the property at be well worth it to keep it in my portfolio over a long period of time. Um, me personally, I prefer to um, Anything long term, unless it's a multifamily, I prefer to do subject to or uh, or on a financing um, type of deals instead of getting a loan uh, in my company or so somebody who I'm partnering with in order to, to take down the property, preferably. That's um, my personal technique. Uh, as far as marketing, I know Trevorrow was talking about how he is um, doing they they pretty much he's pretty much you know a specified marketer me um i switched within the last two to three months um i think since february so what what we're doing now is more of what is called a conveyor belt method so first when we take in we we get our list and, and sometimes i get a list from um diana or other resources that i use and what we do is we send it for a six week time period we will rvm th that list probably about four or five different ways for a six, a six week time period. Then what we do is we take the leads that we have not gotten in contact with and then we start SMSing them for another six weeks. So after that six weeks is done, then who is left who we haven't gotten in contact with, or who hasn't told us to go to H-E-L-L -L or whatever, you know, then we take those and then we um, cold call them. And once we cold call them for six weeks, then we take it and then we're gonna start um, doing direct mail to those lists. So instead of people keep on buying list after list after list, you need to try to, uh, my suggestion is to try to find multiple methods in order to, to, uh, to reach out to those people because not everybody, you know, 
um, accepts your response in the same way. You know, somebody who's younger is more probably used to texting and somebody who's my age or probably older are probably either used to, you know, phone calls and someone who's probably my elder is used to getting stuff in the mail. So we all, you know, have different ways of receiving, you know, our messages um, in the mail. Um, let's see, what else can I talk about, Deanna? Is there anything else you want me to, to speak on? Oh, and I can also, um, you know what, I can give you like, almost like Trevorrow. Let me, uh, let me see if I can show it. Like Trevor's, uh platform, he uses FreedomSoft, and I can show you the one that I use. I use Podio. Um, and the way mine is set up is similar, but I mean, it's probably more complicated than most people's. See, so my campaign is right here. And uh, as you can see, we have different campaigns, how we're attacking everybody, Atlanta vacant list, a pre foreclosure list, different liens, um, bad credit, we're RVMing them, and cold calling RVM. See, so we have a multitude of different lists and different ways that we're um, attacking them and even driving for dollars as well. Um, in our leads, we have a total, and this is just in the Atlanta area right now. I think we have over 474 leads that we, um, that we have in our database right now. And we keep a track similar to uh, Trevorrow's. I think ours is probably um, a little bit different because of the, the, probably just because of the platform and stuff like that. And I can always check and see what's going on within the company, our different leads and uh, what's going on within our company by front. You know, my database shows us what incoming calls are coming in and you know any missed calls and the different seller leads and we also have them put in um manually manually as well um so any any questions in particular diana okay so i just um put a note for people to put um some questions in uh for you and for the panel let me take a look at the q a box you guys if you have questions for uh mr murray please put your questions in the q a box so we can see them but um and if you i think one of the things we didn't touch on today was mindset and i've heard you talk about that too can you talk because i know that everyone's hearing all these like systems and processes and strategies what would you say just to kind of kick us off as we transition into questions if someone's like how am i going to even like learn all these strategies or how am i going to get to the point where i can you know show a deal i just don't feel like i could do it what would you say to that person right now i would say um and i meant to touch on that and i do apologize mindset is probably the most important thing more so than any technique that we we are going through when you have the proper mindset because this game does get tough and it does get rough you should ha always have a, a positive or have somebody on your team to to always give you uh positive feedback and, and know that you have to have a good, a great why. So when you have a great why, then when those days that get rough or whatever, you have your, your reason for, for going through and making your purpose. And I think that everyone should have something written down that they have with them all the time. So when they are, even the, even it's on their phone, if you're, it's a, your phone screen or whatever, your why is the reason why you keep on doing this and, and your purpose for being in here. It can't just be about money because the money is going to come and it, and it can go just as quickly, but it won't sustain you. When you have something solid to stand on, uh, you're a true why, like for me, my why is my son. I want to leave a legacy. So when those days get tough or whatever, you know, or, or a deal fall apart that you thought was going to, you know, cash or whatever, cash through, 
then that'll keep on put, uh, help you to, to push on through and sustain you doing the long run of uh, being an investor. And no matter if it's in real estate or any other industry that you're, you're doing any part of your life, it could be health or whatever, you know, even, you know, sometimes I don't eat well. <laughs> so, and then I have to think about the longevity of me, you know, staying here for my son and that plays a part in it. So then I refer back to that. Okay. The, this is the reason why I need to eat better. Or this is the reason why I need to make that, that call. Cause sometimes it'd be like, man, I just feel like laying in my bed, you know, to be honest with you, sometimes it's like just laying in my bed and wait for the deal to come to me instead of me going after it. But, you know, then I think about, you know, Hey, what's my purpose, you know, then I, I get up and make those calls, even if it's not as many as I want to do that particular day, but I, I'll still do some to keep me pushing, keep me going. That's good. That's good. I'm glad you broke that down because, um, you know, I, I do agree. I feel like mindset, especially when it comes to marketing, like if your phone doesn't instantly ring, like that can really mess with you. Like if you do, if somebody says, okay, I'm going to write down, uh, Mr. Murray's entire formula and it doesn't work for me instantly. Like day one comes and I'm like, okay, Deanna kept saying I'm going to be a millionaire. It didn't happen. Some people are like, I want to like throw in the towel. Like this is isn't it you know so I like that you remember your son and you remember your why to keep going until you finally get the results that you um that you want so what does a typical day look like for you because I know that I I usually run into you if I'm at a real estate meeting you're you know sending out deals you have so many things going on so like how do you organize all of those moving pieces well what I started doing was um like breaking down my day into, you know, priority. What, what is the, the biggest priority for me? Um, so let's say on Mondays from pretty much from nine o'clock to 1130, you pretty much can't get me because I'm normally in a meeting. I'm normally in a meeting with my, uh, my team from nine o'clock to probably about 10, maybe 1030. Then I have from 1030 to 1130 is um, it's a group of investors that I, I, I'm in a, uh, we're in a mindset meeting with. So for that whole hour, we're just talking about, you know, where we are in our businesses and we, you know, sit around and talk to each other and, and help each other out in, um, in our businesses. So after that, then it just depends on if I have a deal going on, is there something I need to do specifically for that day? Then I prioritize my time set aside to take care of that specific thing. Um, you know, um, see where we are, you know, do I need to get on the phone, make some calls, you know, um, do I need to follow up? Because the biggest thing in this industry, you know, people do not follow up. Um, and I, I can tell you several deals that I've gotten and lost <laughs> by not following up and not following up effectively. And I, I think that's the, the biggest thing um, in, the, in this industry. Um, let's see. So that's pretty much, I mean, any other day is just, you know, and what I do is I have oh, uh, a book I learned is traction. So I learned from the book traction of how to, you know, conduct my business and, and how to prioritize my day of taking care of the most important things first and then everything else, you know, fall in place where they, you know, where they lie. That's good. That's good. Um, and then the last thing that, um, Okay, and I think we do have a question for you. The last thing that I wanted to address was networking because you really, you know everybody. So what would you say to, <laughs> right? So what would you say to um, to folks that are new that want to get to that point where, because you know people ask about how do I find buyers? How do I find this? How do I find that? So what would you say to folks that are listening um, that may be making excuses about going to meetings or feeling anxiety about going to meetings? What would you say to those folks as far as networking is concerned? I would say just go and be yourself. I mean, if you're just starting out, just let people let the more people you know, you, you let know what you do, the more successful you'll be in this business. Um, I guess for me, I've always been a, a I guess an introvert outgoing person. So it's people don't really re realize I am a true introvert by heart, but I do go out and by you seeing me all the time, stuff like that, you would never think that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I do go out a lot and I like to meet people and see what people are. And I think the biggest thing is, it's not about what you can get for yourself when you go out, it's about what, how can you help somebody else? Because if you help somebody else, then you get what you want in return. Absolutely. And it may That's not good. be from that person. You know, people look at that person that they help in order to, you know, get reciprocated. But, it, you know, the universe doesn't work that way. 
Right. Right. That's good. That's good. Okay. So someone said, <laughs> someone said introvert, where? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, um, can, okay. Someone said, who's the author of Traction? I know I'm going to put, I've heard uh, great. Gino, um, um, let's see, he's going to ask me, hold on one second. Is Gino, um, Oh, well, Wickman? Yes, Gino Wickman. That's okay. a book. I know, I'm going to put that in my heart. <laughs> and another uh, book that I would suggest is The One Thing by uh, Gary Keller. He's uh, the mm -hmm. owner of uh, Gary uh, Keller Williams, uh, one of the owners of Ga uh, Keller Williams. That that book has really, you know, made a huge difference in, in, in my life. I mean, personally and in business-wise. And that's why, you know, I, I started focusing on one specific thing at a time because they say in that book that you can't, you know, people try to juggle different things and our brain isn't truly, we think we're multitasking, but we truly can't. And in that book, he even defines why we do that. We don't, even computers don't multitask like we, we believe they do. And in that book, it, it breaks down that and, and how it processes. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Good. Oh, and one other book. I have another book, um, the millionaire, the millionaire next door. And I think you know, uh, too often we 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 look at people and we think that they're not worth what they are worth, and and that goes um, mm -hmm. in that book. It it shows how they um, people's perception aren't actual reality. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. This is good. Okay. Um, I know you have we, you have some questions in the chat and you guys remember fill this Q&A box up. I need to see more questions. We're getting ready for this all-star panel in probably about two minutes. Um, let's see. Um, I know someone said how large is your team? I saw that come through. Um, how large is, is your team in regard? Let me find that question so I don't miss a piece of it. I don't even know where the question went, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Uh, yeah, right now it's it's, it's three three slash three point five, and the reason why I say three point five is because I have a VA. My son is on my team, and I also have another VA who works for me part time. So that's why I say three point five. Yeah, so I think that's v cool. So you were able to hire your son. Yeah, he does a lot of the the back office type stuff or whatever. He um he does it. He he text. But he's, I mean, you probably never see him. I think uh, the only person that's ever seen him is Keto, and I had to drag him to one of Keto's meeting. Um, otherwise, he, he'll he stay in the, in the background. He, he's like, you go out there, you speak to everybody, and bring me back the information, I'll do all of the work. <laughs> so, I love that. I love so, that. Yeah. Um, so the VA, what he does is he does all of our marketing. Um, uh, so he handles all of the, uh, he doesn't handle really the SMS. My son handles most of the SMS. He handles the uh, cold calling. He handles the, um, the RVMs and stuff like that. The phone calls come to me, but he puts it in and sets up the systems um, for that. And anything um, in the back office, uh, the VA does a lot of that stuff. Um, he, he's, I mean, he's a great programmer. So a lot of things that um, I, I couldn't figure out, he, he's great with Excel. So a lot of uh, marketing tools and, and we cross collateralized um, different lists. So what he does is he'll take um, like, let's say a vacant list and put it with a bad, bad credit list and take those, take those lists and, and, and take the information and see who, should, who we should target more so than everybody on just those one or two lists. And sometimes we take three or four lists and put those together as well. Very good, very good. Um, okay, I'm trying to see if there is anything. Someone said, what was the second book? Can you repeat those three books really quick? First book was uh, Traction by Gina Wickman. The second okay. book was The One Thing by uh, Gary Keller. And the third book was The Millionaire Next Door. I can't remember who, who's the um, author of that. Let's see. Thomas Stanley. And 
what they did was they came up the book because they, uh, I think, researched over 10,000 or a few thousand um, millionaires and, and show their, their habits and their ways of living or people who they thought were prospective uh, potential uh, millionaires. So. All right. Okay. At this time, I'm going to queue up so we can get this panel started. Um, so I'm sure you have a ton of questions, but I'm going to let you get out the hot seat for two seconds <laughs> because <laughs> you have like seven questions in this box. Really? So what we're going to do is we're going to queue up this, this, this uh, panel because I think a lot of the questions that are being asked, could really anybody can jump in. So what we'll do is like a, I think I can do a gallery view where everybody is being shown. Um, so uh, can we give Mr. Murray, Dwayne Murray, some ones in the chat, please? Because he killed it as well, as promised. Thank you very much. The ones are our applause if you guys haven't caught on. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, Mr. Murray, can you unshare your screen, your screen and we are going to do a gallery view now. I'm gonna try. Share it. How do I unshare it? So go to the bottom and hope, oh, actually up top. If you go up top, you see that bar? You can unshare. Uh, let's see if I can find it. I saw let's some. See. Oh, there we go. It disappeared. <laughs> I, took okay. it. I was able to take it off. Okay. All right. So now, does everyone see all the participants at one time now? Can you comment yes? Okay. Do you guys see like uh, five squares now? <laughs> Yes. Okay, cool. Because I just figured that out while I was talking to you. And that is a lesson in business. You just got to figure it out. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Um, we are going to jump into just, you know, hot fire right now, just straight up questions, drop them in the chat. We're going to go so 330. If you guys want to go into a tiny bit of overtime, that's cool. Um, it's up to our speakers. If they start disappearing, cameras cut off. <laughs> Listen, they've been here since 12, people, okay? So you better ask your question quick, okay? So cool. Um, I want to piggyback um, to get it started off of the question of incorporating family. Um, I, I'm going to uh, pick on keto first because keto, I think I've seen your, uh, your children in, included in your business and running some things. Can you guys comment? We'll start with keto and then anybody can jump in. Comment on how you've incorporated your family to pick up pick up these jobs because people always ask about hiring, but we can use our family, right? Absolutely, you can. Um, now, my children are getting older now, so they're starting to develop their own passions for different things. And of course, uh, I support that. Uh, but I'm a real a proponent for generational wealth. And um, hopefully that was clear in some of the things I said earlier, but that's pretty much a large part of my platform, creating something mm -hmm. bigger than ourselves that will outlive us and outlast us. And uh, oftentimes people ask me, like, you know, how, what, how do I create generation wealth? Seems like I'm not in a position to do that yet. And the truth is, first of all, my backstory is I'm a single dad and I have been a single dad since, since my daughter was two and my son was five. So I've uh, been a single dad for a while and I'd never pounded what I do into my children. But the one thing that I did intentionally do is have them around the conversations. So mm -hmm. they were in my business meetings with me as kids and never paid for daycare, right? So they were, they were in my office. My clients would come in and out. They were with me at job sites um, and they just kind of grew up around it. And so still to this day, even though they have their own passions and things that they're pursuing now, even to this day, they know my business in and out. They know my clients in and out because they were just always around it. Right. And so much so that my son sold his first house when he was 13 years old because he just wow. he, he knew the steps to take. Not because I set him down and said, all right, this is A, this is B, this is C, but because he just watched me do it all of his life. And so wow. I'd say to those who are, are, are asking, how do I get my child involved? How do I plant those seeds in my child? Uh, you know, we've all heard it said before as parents, you know, they're watching what we do more oftentimes they're placing more emphasis on what they see us do than what they hear us say. So just make sure that you, that you, that you expose them, that you, that you put them around the conversation. So good. So good. Anybody else have comments on incorporating family into the business? 
Mr. Olinger? Yeah, I'd also I'd, I'd piggyback on what Tito just said, and uh, he's right to say you don't want to beat it into their head. But once they're involved and they're doing things on a day-to-day -day basis, legally, and I'm once again, disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, but or an accountant for that matter, but talk to your accountant. There are ways to structure a separate LLC for your family members. So for instance, if I have to hire a workout, and I hire a contractor, a 1099 or what have you, I can hire this other company, which my, is owned by my son. So they, as a minor, can receive in X amount of money per year. I think it's $12,000 a okay. year, and it's tax-free. So they can be paid because they're under the poverty level, basically. But it puts them on the grid, so you need to be aware of that, which they have to pay taxes, but the taxes are nominal, but it's a write-off for you. That's, this is all coming out of your pocketbook anyway. So you can structure your children to do age-appropriate chores. For instance, my eight and nine-year-old, he empties my garbage or he licks envelopes or he you know, cleans up for a house with a broom. Or my 14-year-old, he's helping to mow lawns or throw mulch down or things like that that maybe I would normally hire somebody else to do, but get them involved, get them around. I'm going to be talking, talking to my GC and he's doing a project. So you can find ways to legally funnel money into different LLCs to where you can defray your tax burden and on the back end, now they grow up, they can get their own health insurance at a certain age, I think it's 18, and they don't need to be under health coverage when they go to college. Now they're going to college, you continue to pay them doing Excel spreadsheet work and things like that. Now you're funding college without the tax burden. So there's a, a myriad of different legal ways, talk to your accountant to set that up, that you can incorporate family, not only for what um, Keto was saying, on the generational wealth, but you know, planting that seed and then taking advantage of it financially for the entire family, not only yourself, but for your children's benefit down the road. Absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Hardy, do you have something to add? Well, I was gonna say, yeah, um, absolutely 100% right. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Basically, I do the same thing. Uh, well, when I used to do a lot of the yellow letters, uh, my kids used to do because we uh, kind of like design them handwritten. So they used to do a lot of the yellow letters for me. But since we've gotten away from it, like Dwayne said or someone else on the panel said, keto maybe, um, yellow letters definitely still work. The postcards still work. It's just, you know, depend on your area. However, and like Dwayne mentioned, the age group of the, the owner that you're targeting too, that plays a lot in it. But um, yeah, I mean, we had our kids doing it. And now my wife, she worked, you know, behind the scenes doing the advanced research, as I showed you guys with the, um, on my diagram earlier. So the advanced research, she does that behind the scenes. So when we're looking for getting more in depth as far as locating a homeowner or a next of kin, she handles that behind the scenes. So, um, and then of course, you know, we don't want to, like you guys mentioned, force our kids to do anything because my kids are getting older. So they want to do their own thing, but just them knowing that they have a place to go and some other work they could do if they um, determined to love it, then they're all in. So um, it's, it's great to have your family involved for sure. Fantastic. So I love that. Um, I'm really, thank you guys for sharing that. Oh, Mr. Murray, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, what I was going to say, when my son was younger, I even, you know, show him how to even, you know, to delegate his work by because he had to do so many uh, spreadsheets when I used to do a lot of HUD uh, bids or whatever. So that means we were doing like four or five different states. So I showed him how to hire out from what I was paying him to pay somebody a little bit less. So he'll still be making more money by having other people doing the work for him as well. So also not only just being uh, always being an employee, but also being an entrepreneur and being a, a leader as well. Good. That's good. So the kids, the siblings, the cousins, these, this is our first staff, you guys. I know <laughs> that's a common question. And I'll be honest with you, that was my job. That's yep. how I learned real estate. I had to, I, now looking back, I'm like, I think my uncle tricked me a little bit, but <laughs> I just, just got out of school, just got out of um, law school. And that was my job. You know, I was doing 
handwriting his letters, taking stuff to the, um, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. <laughs> work on demand, but that's how I learned this stuff, you guys. So I was, he put his niece to work and then I eventually, now <laughs> I don't do that no more, but <laughs> that's how I learned, cold calling everything. So, um, so find yep. somebody and the kids are home, right? Like everybody's home right now. It's summer, like go through your family. And even if it isn't someone younger, just find out who has time. So instead of trying to go run and buy a system or some big VA service, you know, there's plenty of people that could probably do those jobs that you feel like you don't have time for. So I'm so happy we went there today. That doesn't get covered often. So thank you guys. All right, so let's jump in some more questions. Let's see. Um, uh, someone asked, Keto, do you have a short sale course? Someone asked, that came up twice. Uh, no, I actually don't. I don't have a short sale course. Um, we can facilitate it for you from beginning to end and make the process okay. very easy. I've thought about putting together a short sale course. I have several others, um, uh, but my passion really, uh, over the last year, I've really honed in what my training and focuses are around, and that's in buying and holding for a number of reasons. So that's where my mentorship efforts go right now. Okay, so you do have mentoring available if somebody wants to kind of learn these different strategies? Yeah, specifically the, the strategy around buying and holding real estate. Okay, buying and holding. I have a, I have a, I have a short-term rentals course. Mm -hmm. I have a wholesale mastery course. Um, and I have a course called Investing in the Hood. So those are my three flagship online courses. And then I have a mentorship system around uh, what I call my PR five-step system and how to add that quarter of a million dollars to your net worth every year, year after year. You said add how much to my net worth every year? $250,000. <laughs> so I need to enroll. I can use that. <laughs> in my, uh, but um, does anyone else have courses or mentoring that they like to share? Yeah, I do. Anybody else? Yeah, I do mm -hmm. some mentorships and I do a lot of JVing. Um, my approach is a little bit different, not to say one's right versus wrong, but a lot of times, and I know from my experience, I did not have any money when I started this three years ago. And as a result of the success that I had, people started coming to me, asking me to teach them. And that was kind of a humbling moment because I was still quite honestly learning. I mean, there were things that I understood and I can implement, but there was still a lot, even to this day. I mean, I think we're all of the same mindset. If you're not learning, you're losing. So we're always continually learning, but I was effective enough that people thought that I could share my information and it got me thinking that I should start a consulting um, side of my business, which I did. But more to the point, I saw a lot of the gurus that were out there and, hey, give me $20,000 and I'll be your, your coach for a year. And you get this course and that course and the software. And I, I'm, not, I'm not like that. I'm basically, hey, I'll spend time with you and we'll decide and determine how to find properties. And once we do, I'll help you bring that property to fruition. And the property or the profit from the property will pay both of us as opposed to coming off the hip with a bunch of scratch on the front end, which a lot of us don't have, you know, we'll let the property make the money and we'll take a cut. You know, I'm spending my time. You're bringing the opportunity. I'll help cultivate it. So now you're learning in the process, but at the same time, you don't have to come up with any money. Now it's all going to be dependent on how much time you want to spend doing that. But I work with people today and we've cultivated and found deals together and I help them structure. But the idea behind it is so that you're not going to need me or anybody else for that matter after four or five deals, however many that you feel comfortable. And part of that is just being laser focused on one squirrel. And I call it the dog chasing the squirrel up a tree. You know, a dog can't chase eight squirrels. We can chase one. The dog that chases eight squirrels, all he's doing is running around a tree. So keto, you mentioned a term, and I love it. It's your toolbox, right? And we can all talk about being a homeowner and going out and buying that weird tool that you need to do this odd project. We have no idea how to do it, but we can probably figure it out and buy that tool. And now it sits in your toolbox. All right. You used it that one time, but in order to master it, you got to do it over and over and over again to where, Hey, I've already got that tool. All right. So when Keto was mentioning your toolbox, I look at it as, Hey, you need that tool in your toolbox, but don't bring that tool in too early 
Otherwise, you're going to be chasing too many squirrels. Figure out what you need to do. Do one thing well. You don't have to master it, but be proficient. Then pick up another tool and go after that and build and build and build and build until you have a box like a lot of us have here with multiple acquisition strategies, multiple exit strategies, and short, mid, and long-term plans. So that's what I kind of teach by what I do. A lot of it's creative, just like Dwayne. My first deal was a subject to acquisition. I wholesaled it off and I wholesaled a lot of deals until I started recognizing that, hey, if you can control the lead generation, the lead sourcing, then you can have the world at your feet because if you're truly bringing the deal to the table and your name is on that contract and you can wholesale it as a true wholesaler and still leave profit for investors, then you'll start creating a positive name for yourself. And I remember, I can't remember who it was, we were trying to be careful of how we called wholesalers because sometimes wholesaling can be the bottom feeders because of all the bad apples out there. But there's a lot of great wholesalers that have created fantastic businesses, but they've done that through reputation, through branding, and through putting out a product that leaves meat on the bone and it's not diluting the whole thing. So um, there's a lot to be said for what everybody in this group is doing because we're coming at it from different angles, but our, our viewpoints are all very similar in the sense that there's always respect for others. We're always learning. We're trying to help others in different ways to grow. And I think that's the mentality, Deanna, that you've put together here today. So I appreciate being um, able to be on that panel and contribute in my own way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I think we have more questions. I know you you tapped on generating leads. And so we got that question again. So if we if you guys want to recap um, on your different strategies um, for finding deals, you know, that's always a hot topic. How are you guys finding deals? Um, I know we talked about different lists and stuff like that, but what are you guys doing um, right now? What do you think is relevant in 2020? And, um, you know, you could just say the name of what you do. Um, anybody could jump in on like your favorite way to generate leads right now. Well, I mean, uh, my, my favorite way is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I just purchased a list from different list providers, such as yourself, Deanna. And uh, also, of course, inside of Freedom Solve, the lists are provided certain type of lists, which is uh, the absentee owners and the uh, owner occupied properties. Um, they have some lists that's inside of Freedom Solve as well. Um, like the pre foreclosures, but I haven't really used those. Like I said, I just purchased those from a different list source. So that's pretty much how we've been getting our leads. We just purchase them and then we hit them with our proven method of uh, email templates and text message uh, templates and then our phone script on the third contact attempt. That's good, that's good. Um, anybody else wanna comment on generating leads, finding deals? I mean, okay. To me, I'm, it's just like how I already come. I mean, just, a, you know, whatever market, marketing method, you know. Um, I've never tried PP, uh, was it PPC? Aren't you using PPC, Carson? Carson uses PPC. I've never really delved into PPC. I've always yeah. been direct, either direct mail, um, RVM, the phone call. That's, that's about. Oh, and I used to do uh, uh, MLS and I'm probably going to, probably soon, within the next six months or a year, probably go back to that as well because of the market shift. Yeah, Deanna, I've, I've had, uh, when I first started out, I didn't have the money to do SEO and PPC like I am now. So I, I recognized from my previous background, I was in the Fortune 500 world, uh, sales and marketing was my background. So I understood sales, I understood marketing and branding, and I, I understood typically what it takes to sell and to buy. And people that want to sell have some type of motivation, either profit or a necessity of some kind. And what we always tried to do is I didn't want to be part of a, a, a me too concept. And I, I'd be careful how I say that because we're in this me too world right now, but <laughs> I call it me too investing where you're standing in a room of investors. How are you finding your leads? Well, I'm buying lists. Me too. How are you finding leads? I'm driving for dollars. Me too. We're all kind of doing those same things. And not to say that they're bad, because a lot of people are doing them. But guys like Trevorrow have systems that drive that number down. You saw his numbers. They're, they're very strong, and it's numbers-based. So for me, what I found was targeting motivated sellers in a different way that other people weren't doing. And one thing that I was very successful with, and I still do from time to time, 
However, I mentioned earlier, you either have time or you have money. And at the beginning, I had a lot of time. So I would legitimately go down to the courthouse and I would sit in the law library or wherever I needed to do, and I would pull dispossessory leads. And a dispossessory, for those who don't know what a dispossessory is, is basically an eviction. So a landlord has a property that they're renting, they've evicted somebody, they have to get the magistrate court to pull them out, the sheriff shows up, right? But you have to file paperwork. Now all that's public information and it's free. Mm -hmm. A little bit laborious until you understand the system at that respective courthouse. But once you get that down, like the first time I went, it took me like four hours to get 50 leads. But after that, I was able to go in in 30 minutes, I'd get 50, 60, 80 leads every two weeks because they're continually changing and they're updated. And nobody's calling those people because mm -hmm. they're not on these lists yet. They're, you're ahead of the game, but you're spending the time. So for those of us now that don't have the time, those lists that Yana provides really make a lot of sense because now yep. I'm, I'm just going to spend that money because my time's worth something. But the dispossessory leads, a lot of people think, well, why would a, a, an investor who owns a, a rental property want to sell to another investor? Well, a lot of people don't understand is a lot of these landlords are just kids that inherited grandma's house and they didn't know what to do with it. And, you know, granted, there's guys that are out there that have a lot. And the whales that we find out there are portfolios. You're getting one of three things. I want to sell. I don't want to sell this house, but I've got this other one that I want to sell. So maybe you get that deal. Or, you know what? I'm not wanting to sell anything, but I'm glad you called me. I'm looking to buy some to add to my portfolio. Now you've increased your buyer's list. But what's nice about most of the dispossessory leads, and it depends on the county, is you get their phone number. So you're not sending them a letter. You're not sending them an email. You're calling these people and you're calling them directly. Yep. And now you've got a warm lead. Why is it warm? Because you know the motivation. They want to sell, but they've got a problem. They got an eviction. They got a problem. The house is probably distressed. So there's, you've got to figure out what that is. So doing dispossessory leads through the magistrate court at respective courthouses is a great source of leads. And we still use that today. So when I JV with people and they're looking at how to generate leads, it's one of the ways I walk them through that is through those. And then I evolved into the SEO and the PPC, which now I spend hardly any time looking for leads, but I pay for them. They come through, if you're paying for a list or you're paying for an SEO, you're paying for it one way or another, just no matter what works well for you. That's good. That's good. I love how you broke down, we call that the eviction list, but I love how you broke that down because I feel like, you know, I, we provide the information, right, as a list provider, and I see everything from like a legal perspective. So you're speaking my language when you're saying dispossessory and so forth and so on. When you break that down, number one, yeah, you guys are able to attack saturation because I'm telling you, in eviction, the eviction list, we go case by case by case, right, Mr. Olinger, because you used to do that. It is very tedious, but once you are able, and, and it's so funny you said that, you're like, and then I got like 50, you know, 50 to 80 leads. Like once you're done and you found all the houses, you know, this is a smaller list, but man, who is really going to get in those trenches and do that? Um, so that is a great list. And yes, you will have a phone number. Everything's in there. It's accurate, live information, like they were there in the last 30 days, right? And um, thank you, Keto, for that. So dispossessory, because we are removing, we're asking the court to remove them from our property, right? So that's how you remember it. We're dispossessing that person. And another thing I want to touch on is a lot of people think that that has stopped because of what we're hearing in the media. But remember, this is a court process. And so when we're pulling information, we're pulling it at the filing, right? So we want to be able to, we're getting all of that information at the filing. So there are plenty of people who are still filing, but even though their day in court it has been delayed, that's what you're seeing on television right now, they're still dropping their paperwork off. Like if that courthouse is open, they're still dropping that paperwork off. So you can still take advantage of evictions. And I feel that evictions are even more, they're even red hot, like the best list to be working right now, because I personally have interned in that court and you got to picture a courthouse where people are literally unable to get a seat. Like that particular day in court is already crazy, but it's going to be even worse once the faucet is back on and everyone's able to go to court. The courthouse in general is going to be a hot mess in the next couple of months. So if you could get in there and talk to those people, like Mr. Olinger just said, um, you are really going to do well. You know what I mean? So um, thank you for that. And, um, and thank you for breaking 
now PPC because I think people hear that as well, but they don't really understand it and what it takes and, and really explaining that that is an investment, you know, once your business gets to that point, right? So um, anybody else want to comment on, I think we got everybody. Uh, Keto, do you have anything you want to add about generating leads? Uh, yeah, I'll be brief because um, personally, I'm, I'm not doing, I'm not actively generating leads. Um, all of everything that I do is coming from prior relationships. Uh, again, right. working with a lot of wholesalers and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say this, um, make sure that you're not in business, that, you, that the fact that you're in business is not a secret. It's amazing how many people are in business and the people around them don't know what they do. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a great example. Um, there's a lady who works in the flooring department at Home Depot and she knows why I'm there. You know, we have built some somewhat of a rapport, so much so that one of the most recent short sales that we negotiated was um, somebody that she referred to me. When the lady called me and said I was heard by such and such, I had to think for a minute to say, okay, who, you know, she said the lady at Home Depot. And then I remembered. So make sure that people know what you do. Um, I still think the best form of marketing is word of mouth marketing. Fantastic. Um, and we may go into a tiny bit of OT, just a tiny, or y'all can y'all bear with me a little bit because we have six more questions. <laughs> but I do, I do want to come touch on um, as promised real estate branding. Um, so Keto, if you could elaborate just a little bit on um, branding yourself and all of you guys can do that because we I certainly know what all of you do because of the way that you've represented yourself social media and meetings, things like that. So Keto, could you touch on that? Uh, I can, I will. Um, Deanna, when you asked me to talk about branding, I thought, wow, I've taught everything under the sun, but I've never <laughs> been asked to talk about branding. <laughs> yes. Um, but but uh, I did think of, you know, three things that I try to be consistent with or to think about when it comes to my personal branding. Um, and I guess I would call them the three C's. I try to make sure that, first of all, everything that I put out there is is clear. You know, that is clear. For me, clear means that it's not too much going on in your advertising, that you're not distracting um, in all of the different things you try to fit into a marketing piece, um, that, that the images that you use, of course, you know, my advertising has a lot to do with, with meetups and, and education and things like that. So for me, um, you know, I try to make sure that all of the images that I put forth are, are high quality images and that my fonts, et cetera, that my fonts are complementing each other and not so, you know, you see some stuff that's so cursive, you, you have to use your grandma's reading glasses to try to figure out what it says because it's just, you know, they got too cute with it. So mm -hmm. for me, the first thing, the first C is to be clear in your marketing. The second, um, and I should say this too, when I say clear, I also mean that you have a call to action. Like what is it that you want them to do as a result of seeing your marketing piece? Um, and that should be prominent. I've seen so many different types of things that I knew they were advertising something, but it's like, okay, so what do you want me to do? Where's the phone number? Like, is there email? What, what do I, what am I supposed to do with this information? Um, the second thing is be consistent. Like, uh, and this is just true in marketing in general. Like we've heard it said before, those of us seasoned vets know that somebody needs to see your marketing piece like what, seven times before they're gonna make a buying decision anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Most of us on here know Will Galloway, um, phenomenal investor, wholesaler in the area. And I often remember his story. He talks about how when he first started, um, he sent out marketing pieces month after month after month and something like four, three, four, five months passed and he had not done a single deal. And he just when he was about to get uh, concerned or maybe pivot and say this does not work he got a phone call from a lady who had seen his marketing month after month after month and mm -hmm. she decided to call him when she was ready right and because she had seen him so many times she called him and that she ended up having two houses um, and that ended up being his first two deals and like the rest is history he's done hundreds of deals since then um, so be consistent also for me being consistent means that you know whether it's a branding logo or font i try to keep those things consistent throughout all of my different marketing pieces uh, i remember when my kid my son now who's 17 having a, a quarantine graduation 
um, the next week. Uh, he was, but when he was a kid, my mom used to work at the postal service. And at three years old, whenever he'd see the postal bird on anybody's vehicle, he'd say Mima, Mima, because he equated that bird with what he knew his Mima does. So, or the Nike symbol, the list goes on and on. So that is a great part of consistency, making sure that you have something that people can associate with you in every one of your marketing pieces. So clear, consistent, and the third thing I would say is be concise. You've seen folks uh, uh, advertisements and it's like they just wrote the whole paragraph. Like you really don't even need to go to the meetup because everything they're gonna talk about, they crammed into this five by seven postcard. And I'm like, nobody's reading. <laughs> Who's gonna read all of that? Like that's just, mm -hmm. it's crazy, right? So, um, uh, you know, make sure that you're concise uh, in your marketing. You know, what are the bullet points? What are, what's the point you want to get across? I think the uh, new age term for it is minimalistic. So, you know, be, be minimalistic, less is more. Good, good. I hope that good. helps, Deanna. It does. And, and one of the reasons why I really wanted this um, incorporated, we had um, a real her um, in our last meeting and he opened up talking about branding um, because that his, his name is Terrence Takes the Town and so he has a whole vision behind his brand and but uh, Keo when I first met you I remember seeing like your pop-up sign and I was like wow that's impressive like all of your stuff it really is what you said is consistent the photo like we can all visualize you in a particular photo um, you with your book everything is consistent and I think this is important when we even if you're marketing to a list or you're driving for dollars when you present yourself to a seller people pay attention to that right like they're looking at your website they're googling you they're looking at your social media and so even if you don't have a lot of stuff i think it's important to hear from folks that have been doing it um how they're branded like i'm looking in the background and i see mr olinger's sign you know what i mean like so now if, if you've been on this zoom you at least know what his logo looks like you at least know what he's got going on and i've seen that consistently on his social media every single thing looks the same right mm -hmm. so um i just really wanted to touch on that and i think you did a fantastic job like and we just need to keep hearing this stuff from folks that have been doing it awesome awesome does anyone else have a comment on branding or how they've um how they present themselves especially when it comes to sellers kind of looking you up and stuff i think you know nailed it i mean your brain you know Dwayne, you mentioned um amy ransdale i i sat down i know amy pretty well um, she made, she's a social media expert and she built it into my head on top of what I already knew. Your brain is another muscle in your body. And if you keep training people's brains with branding consistently and consistently, they're going to associate your name with that company and they're going to know what you do. If your friends don't know what you do, you're doing something wrong. You got to have that brand consistently in front of them talking real estate whether they want to talk about it or not to a point because then they'll get sick of hearing about you but anyway you, you consistently are in front of people um and you're always trying to reach out and grow your network um networking is a critical way of getting into this business um i have my own ria now but i started off going to every single ria i could physically go to my wife was like where are you going tonight where are you going this afternoon and i was just constantly at ria's and just osmosis surrounding myself with people like this panel that know more than I do in areas that I had no idea about they even existed. I've now surrounded myself with people that have forgotten more than I know. And that's how you grow. And if you can brand yourself while learning and networking, you're going to be successful. It'll take time. It's not easy. It's work. It's not play. They don't call it them going to play, going to work. So put your time and effort in. And there's no easy path. Every guy in here listening to them, they didn't start off like this. They worked their tail off and now they're reaping the rewards and they're still growing. How do you brand yourself, expand yourself? And that, that comes down to your network. And that's why I think networking is a key to this. And if you can create the more people you know, the, the better off you're gonna be. Good, that's good. Um, any other comments? I'm going to pull up these last five questions. Anything on branding? Otherwise, we can roll into the next question. 
Um, what strategy do you like using the most and why? I guess that is to a creative strategy. Is there a creative strategy that you prefer, you guys? And if so, why do you like it? I would say for me, probably own a financing because it's less uh, of a headache because you don't have to deal with banks and stuff like that. Um, you know, you're dealing with just directly the owner and, you know, you go to the closing, you don't have to worry about any I uh, do on sale clauses. You don't have to worry about all of the other, you know, potential hiccups that you would, you know, subject to deal. Um, that's, you know, my thoughts. Yeah, mine would be, um, mine would be pretty much the same. I, I love subject twos uh, when I run across them when they come down the pipeline. Um, and I love doing owner financing on the back end, even on the front end in certain cases. Um, I mean, just less of a headache for me because we already have the documents and the paperwork in place for those type of deals. So it's just, um, it just moves selling for us on, in, in that regard. So I love subject to owner financing, but also my wholesaling as well because it's just so quick and fast, get in and get out too. So, you know, I love them all pretty much, I guess I can say. <laughs> Yeah, and I, like before, it. let me just say one thing, Carson, before you, I was okay. going to say, you should let the, the deal lead you to which way you, you, you handle it and not you try to direct the deal. I mean, no. but go ahead, Carson. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. I, I love them all because the deal kind of dictates it. And that's why this, this business can be exciting because if, if you've got the, the toolbox that Keto mentioned, you now have the ability to do all of these different things. And that's the fun of what we do create a solution for somebody and the deal kind of dictates it but there's a thrill in wholesaling there's a thrill in subject too because you can do it so cheap the owner finance just mm -hmm. runs that creativity brain and it, it, it's just a lot of fun so yeah i don't have any one that i gravitate to but you know the other thing i would say to what Dwayne just mentioned is through networking i don't do a hard money i do a private capital now because of branding and consistency People are coming to me saying, hey, how can I be a part of this? How can I lend you money to be a part of this, either passively or actively or JV? So I don't have to go searching for money now. So you know, once you find four or five people that are willing to fund your deals, now you're not dealing with the banks. You're just dealing with cash and you can move quite effectively. I mean, I, I'll say for me, uh, it, I'm, I'm in love with passive income. So whatever gets me to passive income, whether it's a great deal that's so cheap that, you know, that it makes sense for me to pay cash for it, then okay. If it's a short sale deal where the numbers are great and on the back end, if I got to do um, some private equity, private money, uh, that's going to get me to passive income, then, then that, you know, if it's an owner finance deal, the list goes on and on. So whatever is going to get me to a place where once I get this deal in my portfolio, first of all, that I can get it in my portfolio and that it makes financial sense so that every month uh, I've created something that that's going to uh, pay me month after month. That's what I'm after. That's good. Did I get everyone? I think I did. Okay. Um, we have one uh one last question which i think is interesting um really quick someone said is there any guarantees with keto's 250k mentoring uh i don't think there's any guarantees with anything uh, it's not right. a guarantee that we're gonna wake up in the morning we pray god that we do <laughs> yes. um the truth of the matter is i uh i've got plenty of uh case studies real life examples testimonials i've got people who one guy in particular 24 years old, just wrote a book, retired at 24, because after meeting me, he now owns 30 plus doors, and he left his almost six-figure a year job uh, as a Morehouse College grad. So uh, plenty, of, plenty of examples like that, um, but the reality is you know, we can't guarantee that anybody's going to take anything. There's, there's some people, unfortunately, that's going to take three pages of notes from today's meeting and uh, log off and never look at those notes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can provide the information. Uh, I, I've been pretty good at providing information for 23 years. And what you do with it, we'll be in your ear. We'll mentor you along the way. We've got productivity coaches on our team that do what they do to help get in your head space and to help uh, push you when that's necessary. Um, but you have to be the one to take action. 
Excellent. Fantastic. Um, and then the last question, um, and then we'll bring it on home, get your information and everything. The last question was someone wanted to use a strategy of pulling equity from a property they owned to invest in real estate. Do you guys have any comments on that strategy? I've kind of summarized it. Hopefully I said that right. <laughs> but I think that's what they're asking. I'd be careful in leveraging anything you have. I mean, I'm a I'm not debt free, Dwayne, but I like the mentality. So I wouldn't want to refinance my own personal property to fund my business. I would try and find the money elsewhere. I mean, it's, it's highly lucrative. I saw that question. We got half a million dollars worth of equity. I mean, right now the banks aren't loaning on their LTVs as high as they used to. Some banks aren't even doing HELOCs at all. So you might have a difficult time doing that, but if you own it free and clear with a half a million, that's a pretty good risk, but just, using your own capital in your home and putting that at risk, that, that, that I'd be a little leery of that. So um, the way you would do it, if you, if you wanted to go down and just get a home equity line of credit and pull from that, but now you've got a monthly note, you got to pay whether you're making money on that, per, on that capital or not. Um, so I find it better to find a deal, get that deal that makes sense, and then go to people and say, hey, I want to fund this deal. Now, maybe you're giving up some of the money to do that, but you're not putting anything at risk. And one of the biggest things in this business is not how much you make, it's how much you don't lose. If you don't lose any money, you're doing great. Now, I've never lost a penny, but there's been some deals where I broke even, and I was grateful to have done that. And the reason I did break even is because I bought the house correctly. I didn't buy it with such a thin margin of error that if the sky was raining one day, I lost business and lost money. So I'm risk adverse. I like to use other people's money. Networking allowed me to do that. And if you're patient or JV, there's four guys sitting right in front of you that could help you do that, maybe find a deal. I would encourage you to reach out to one of us or somebody in your community to help you join venture on a deal. You might, like I said, you might not profit as much, but you're not gonna lose as much if you make a mistake. Good. Any other comments on that? I would ask the question, why, why, why would they even, why would you do it? Number one, especially if, if you haven't done a deal in real estate before, I would say start off with free techniques or low money techniques before you go into, you know, pulling some money like that out of, out of your home. What's the purpose for doing so? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, we have made it to the finish line. Thank you guys so much. This was fantastic. Can we give them some ones in the chat? And I have one last thing to request of you guys in true Deanna fashion. I need a picture. So can you guys smile really big for social media? <laughs> because I'm going to tag you and tell everybody how y'all <laughs> killed it today. Give me one second and I'll let you free. So you go have lunch and enjoy your day. All right. Can everybody smile? Let me turn my flash on. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. Hopefully I was smiling too. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you so much. This was absolutely amazing. I believe we did what we came to do. I, I sound churchy, right? But uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure what to say there. But I think I did, <laughs> did what we came to do, right? And um, I thank yes. you guys so much. Thank you for giving us your Saturday. I see everybody going crazy in the chats. <laughs> right. All hearts and minds are clear. <laughs> yeah, so I, I thank you guys. Um, I'm really, really grateful. Um, I honestly consider you all like my big brothers in the industry. These are people that I know that if I have a question, I'm, this is who I'm going to contact you guys. So I'm grateful. I've learned so much from y'all over the years. I'm honored to even be asking y'all to come to a meetup I facilitate um, because I got started coming to your stuff, right? So thank you guys. Please tap in with them. Um, if you could say your social media handles um, so everybody can make sure they're following you and keeping up with what you're doing. Um, let's just go real quick. Uh, starting Mr. Murray, how do we follow you? 
Um, I'm on Facebook. Don't ask me my Instagram. I just know how to get on it. <laughs> You've been posting. <laughs> I just know how to get on it. I, uh, I'm looking at my uh, handle right now as we speak, but I am on Facebook as Dwayne Murray. as my real name. Um, let's see. Uh, what is my Instagram? I don't know. I think it's uh, D Murray 17 or something like that. You'd have to tell me better than I can tell myself. <laughs> Y'all yeah, message me if you want his Instagram. Yeah, it's Dwayne, it's Dwayne Murray 17. I just found, figured out, <laughs> look it up. Uh, that's my Instagram or whatever. Well, but I will be posting more on Instagram than I have been and uh, doing more live. Like I, like, like I told you I was going to a couple of weeks ago. So Yes, you're doing good. You're doing good. Yes, fantastic. Okay, who's next? Who's next? How do we reach you on social? Uh, I'll go next. My name, my okay. middle initial is J. Right. And you spell my name, Keto, K-I-T-O. So I'm Keto J. Johnson everywhere. KetoJJohnson.com, Keto J. Johnson on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on YouTube. So Keto J. Johnson. Good. <clears throat> Who's next? Um, mine is Trevara Hardy, T-R-E-V-A-R-O, Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y. That's on uh, Facebook. That's my website. Um, Instagram, as I mentioned earlier, is Real Estate Hardy. Also, Hardy BZ. Um, my Facebook group is Atlanta Wholesale Deals and More. Atlanta Wholesale Deals and More is my group. Okay. Drawinger. Uh, on Facebook, at Carson Olinger. You can also follow me on my business page, which is Capital City Equity Group. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel under Carson Olinger. My website for investors is capcityeg.com. I've got a buying site where we bring our deals in. That's North Atlanta Home Buyer. Not on Instagram yet, but I'm looking at doing so. Um, I run and operate um, two other professional Facebook groups. One is North Lake RIA, which is our real estate investment association. And the other one I created because Facebook is all about positive, positive, positive. Look at me, look at me, look at me. But to learn and with the mentality we have, we're trying to teach other people what we did wrong. I would encourage you to subscribe or follow our real estate investor fails page. So we're encouraging people. I didn't know that was your group. <laughs> yeah, we, put, we put that out there. So the things that we did wrong that we're willing to share to help other people, we put pictures of things that are totally wonky, things we did that we screwed up on to help the other people learn. So it's Real Estate Investor Fails is another Facebook page. And you can check us there too. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, does anybody have anything else to add? I think we are... I want to make sure I don't cut anyone off. Um, okay, guys. So, um, and of course, I'm Deanna Britt. I'm the owner of Law Clerk On Demand. I'm Law Clerk On Demand on everything, Instagram, Facebook. Um, if you have questions about uh, lists, you can go to lawclerkondemand.com. We provide probate, evictions, divorce. You can go right to our website. We actually revamped our website, so go check it out. Tell us what you think. Um, many of the questions that you have about um, lists can be answered by watching the videos. This an entire meeting was recorded. Mr. Olinger, I'm going to repost your post because it's coming. There you go. I put it in the um, the chat for you. This entire meeting was recorded and will be available on Law Clerk On Demand's Instagram page. Um, I'm sorry, cannot multitask. Okay, this entire meeting <laughs> was recorded and will be available on Law Clerk On Demand's YouTube page. So if you guys want to watch the replay, I'm just going to take a look at it, make sure it's edited correctly, and I will make it available. So if you couldn't hear something, if you missed something, you can go back and watch this entire thing. Um, also, this is brought to you by South Atlanta RIA. Um, please, if you enjoyed this meeting, take a picture, tag us on Instagram, you know, tag Law Clerk On Demand. I'll tag everybody else if you missed their IG handles, but tag us. Let Stacy know you enjoyed it, okay? And consider joining South Atlanta RIA. I actually set this up. You're going to get an email 
that has the information on how to join South Atlanta RIA. Um, like I said, you guys strongly consider joining the RIA. Everything that we've done over the last two months has been virtual. You don't even have to live in the state of Georgia, so you can be a virtual member if you live in New York, California, or wherever, and still watch and get real estate information virtually like you did today. Okay, so thank you so much. Make sure you're following everyone that spoke today. Certainly follow Law Clerk On Demand. Uh, all of our panelists, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for really teaching your hearts out today. I'm so grateful. Um, and I wanna wish you a wonderful Saturday. And that's all I got, lunch on me. Please go have your lunch on me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Nora. Right. Appreciate the opportunity. Gentlemen, yes. it's a pleasure working with you. Hopefully likewise likewise yes yes thank you all thank you for that thank you all it was a pleasure all righty okay guys well enjoy your saturday thank you so much we are done and um that's it bye all right thanks <laughs> bye. all right guys cool